Sports Hot Seat is brought to you in part by Sport Buff in Place Alexis Neon, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear. Welcome to the Sports Hot Seat, Mitch Garber with Mitch Melnick. And Mitch, our guests today have 11 Stanley Cup rings between them. Mark Hepscher of Global Television has none. And our other guest, of course, must have the other 11. Hall of Famer Henri Richard, the Pocket Rocket. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. 11 Stanley Cups. Now, you know, you talk to athletes who've won a couple of championships. What, what was more thrilling, the first, the second, the third? I well, mean, well, I guess, 11. I, I guess the first was... Uh, but then uh, the last one has to be the, 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 the main, uh, the main, the main uh, thrill for, for myself because of what happened in between with Al McNeil, the coach, and all this. So, and then I had scored a winning goal. So right, 1971. 1971-72. The worst coach I ever played for. What? <laughs> That's what I said, but I didn't really mean it. I, <laughs> I, I thought uh, B, uh, Al was a hell of a guy, good guy, and uh, not that bad of a coach, but I was mad because he didn't play me, and uh, that's my style. I wanted to play all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a lot of incidents in that series in 1971, right? I mean, Fergie had stormed off the bench before the end of a game one night in that series because he wasn't yeah, playing a whole right, lot. Yeah, right, I think. Yeah. And uh, it really set the stage for that night in Chicago. That's, that's the one cup you feel you stole? Oh, there's no doubt about that. We were underdog. Uh, starting the uh, against Boston, we must have been ten to one underdog. Uh, there's no way that we we finish. I don't know how many points behind Boston, and Boston had a, a better team. But uh, this guy by the name of Ken Dryden came in and uh, stole the cup from uh, from them. I I don't I have to say. So Spe uh, speaking of modesty, Henry, I, I feel a little guilty calling him Henry. But uh, <laughs> eleven Stanley Cup rings, you're wearing none. Let's see your hands. Uh, no, no, no uh, Stanley Cup well, rings on your they're, they're too, they're, I, I feel they're heavy. They're too heavy, and I, I like very small ring. And then uh, you know we didn't get uh, we we didn't get any uh, first five Stanley Cup. Uh, we got uh, I guess the fifth one. We uh, we had to we paid half of our ring <laughs> with the team. So uh, what did they give you for the first five? Uh, in between, well, I must, uh, I guess it was turkey or something like <laughs> that. A turkey. <laughs> which you didn't save, I guess. <laughs> During Christmas, <laughs> which Let's we didn't save. <laughs> Hebsey, you grew up watching uh, Henri Richard play. <laughs> you were in Toronto, Henri playing for the Montreal Canadiens in the true Canadian mm. Maple Leaf rivalry days. Oh, yeah, it was great. And uh, you know what, it was, I think that a lot of people, I mean, Toronto fans, they don't hate Montreal. The, the word hate is very strong in any kind of rivalry. In the 60s, the two teams played each other 14 times a year. So it was almost impossible not to work up a, 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 an intense dislike. But at the same time with the Montreal teams, and especially with fellows like Henri Richard, I think Dave Keon was a similar in Toronto, you, you, you couldn't hate the guy. You respected him the way he played the game. And I think if you ask any Toronto Maple Leaf fan about Henri Richard, they'll grudgingly say, you know, what a great hockey player and, and, uh, and a gentleman, a classy guy, and he would never, uh, he's not the kind of a guy you could boo or, or, like with Billy Smith, you know, at the Montreal Forum when he was announced as an ambassador along with Henri and Bernie Perron to, to the, to the 100 Stanley Cup. You know, people booed. They remembered battling Billy Smith. People, people would never boo Henri Richard outside of Montreal because they realized that uh, he, he came to play and he played to win, but he, he played clean and he was a gentlemanly player and, um, you know, I think that goes a long way. Whereas a John Ferguson, for example, people may remember that he beat up a couple of guys or... Eddie Shack. Yeah, Eddie, Eddie Shack. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Eddie Shack. You know, I, I've been, I was in Toronto. I was very young. I was 16 years old. The first few games of Apia against uh, St. Mike's and mm. the Marlboros, actually. And uh, people used to cheer me. They used to love me down there. Uh, that's how I got the, uh, the name Pocket Rocket. Oh, is that right? Yeah. There was an ad in a paper. I think it was the Toronto Star or mm -hmm. Globe and Mail. 
which said the, see the rocket on Sunday on Saturday night and see the pocket rocket play on Sunday on Sunday afternoon. That's where I got the name pocket. And then uh, I, I always remember going down the Maple Leaf Garden and the place was packed to over five five thousand people. Double uh, headers. 15, they people. had double headers double on headers Sundays, right? Then, yeah, right. Junior right. double headers, yeah. Yeah, and they cheer me because maybe and then when you're smaller, I, I was only sixteen years old, weighed about one hundred and ten pounds. <laughs> and being hit by uh, Jerry James used to play with the uh, Winnipeg uh, Blue Bombers. Blue yeah. Bomber, right. Right. Uh, Henry, if I, if I were to be a future NHL hockey player, two people I wouldn't want to be would be Wayne Gretzky's little brother and right. Mario Lemieux's little brother. What about Maurice Richard's brother? Exactly. <laughs> you were Rocket Richard's yeah. little brother, but yet became a superstar. But how much, well, uh, how, how, how was it being uh, Rocket's uh, little brother starting out? You know, a uh, 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 plain hockey player I was. I wasn't a su superstar. I, I work, I, I'm a type of guy like, uh, I like to uh, Muller or, uh, Carbon, a uh, hard worker, Gilmore. hockey player. Gilmore, mm. right, Gilmore. Well, you're naming superstars now, too. Well. Not in the same class, maybe, as like Mario class. and Rocket. No, and, and that's uh, it. And uh, forget what I, want, I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about, about, being, about being the Rocket's kid brother. Yeah, right. Oh, I didn't, uh, yeah, it must have been, uh, yeah, it must have been pretty tough. I must have had a, a lot of pressure, but I didn't really feel it. <laughs> I wanted to play hockey all my life. That's what I wanted to do. And, uh, uh, it's funny, in school they asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up. I always said a brickler, a brickler. A bricklayer. A bricklayer. <laughs> <laughs> I never said a hockey player because I was, you know, kind of shy. They, they would say that he's pretty cocky, but that's the way I felt. I wanted to play with Montreal Canadiens. Then, today they want to play in the NHL, but they don't care where. So it, it didn't take you uh, long to establish yourself on your own, in your own mind, about having to follow the Rockets oh, skates. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt about that. I didn't feel, you know, I didn't feel I was, uh, uh, I, I didn't feel any pressure. I must have had a pressure, but I didn't feel it. Uh, my style was different than Morris. I was a playmaker more than uh, trying to score goals. Did, did you feel did it? he talk to you? I wonder if he, if your brother would say to you, look, Henri, you just do your thing and I'll do my thing. No, did he it's help funny. you? It's funny. No, never talk to me. Never? Uh, never talk to me in, uh, about hockey or after the game. Never did. La or last week we had last week we had Dicky Moore on, and he said that in his I think it was eight years he played with Rocket on the same line. They never talked about hockey once. That's right. <laughs> and now you say you never spoke to the Rocket about hockey. Right. right. Has he the Rocket spoke ever spoken about? <laughs> no, he never spoke to me about hockey. He never so. spoke to anybody about <laughs> hockey. He, never he didn't spoke. want to give up a secret. Yeah, he played the he game. Never spoke to me. Yeah. <laughs> Why did he have to speak about it? He could play it so well. Yeah. What did he have to talk about? Well, he was on that line too. Right. I mean, Dicky yeah, Moore. Dicky and Morris. Yeah. When yeah. I what a line. I, I actually yeah. started with uh, Bellevue and Bert Olmsted because the very first shift, uh, very first game that I played with Montreal, uh, Bum Bum Jeffrey on the Earth. And then they put me at, on the right wing with uh, Olmsted and uh, Belleville for maybe t a few games till Jeffrey Young came back. Did you, did you were you ever in awe of your own brother? Did you ever like shake your head and go, how did he do that? I mean, did you ever stop and find yourself enjoying yourself watching your brother play? Uh, oh, before I joined Canadian, yes. But uh, while I was there, no, not really. <laughs> uh, don't forget, Morris was at the end of his playing days when I first came up. Uh, actually, he, he, I think he, he's saying that very often that uh, uh, he wouldn't, I don't think he would have go any longer. I, when, I, when I came in Montreal, that's how he, he decided to play again because mm -hmm. he didn't want to, he thought he was finished. He was a little overweight and he had problem with his weight. So. What's the age difference between you two? We're 15 years different. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, he was already well established when you were still... Right, well, I was only six years old when he first started in 1940, <coughs> 40, 41, 42, I guess. Uh -huh. We have the Rockets' uh -huh. last goal here. Uh, you were on the ice. This was in 1960, the fifth of your five consecutive Stanley Cups. Mm -hmm. The Maple Leafs were the victims, Johnny Bauer. And uh, what a hell of a way to go out with a, with a nice backhand. Uh, do you remember? Do you remember that play? I, I don't remember. It's, it's, it's been quite a few years. <laughs> if I see it, I'll remember. We're gonna we're gonna get to it in in, in just a second. There it is. Here we go. I think. Uh, yeah, you Timmy were, Horton, there's Henri. Right? Who are you this chasing there? Tim Horton. Yeah, Tim Horton. Rocket yeah. final goal. The rocket goes behind the net. The puck squirts loose in front. A backhander. Oh. Vintage Richard. Now we see him no more. I uh, went in around the net and uh, made a pass to, I think, to Henry or Dickie Moore. 
And after that, the puck hit the goalkeeper, and uh, I pick up the puck, and I let go a backhand, and I, I finally got the, that goal. I remember the rocket. The rocket. What, uh, <laughs> what did you feel when he announced his retirement? I don't know. I, you know, you, I really don't know. what. I don't really remember when he did actually announce his retirement because it, actually he played, he trained with us, and I think he had score, and and, and that uh, game camp. that and in that training camp, that game that we played before because we used to scrimmage quite a bit, and I think Maurice has scored three, three goals, so I was very surprised that but, he, he, he retired. But it certainly gave you your own identity. After that, from from 1960 right through to uh, when was your last year? 74. 70, 74. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you certainly you escaped his shadow. Yeah, I did. But I was, you know, I, I was pretty good goal scorer then uh, as a junior, and then I I kind of lost a little bit of that. I was more a playmaker because of Morris. I I was looking for him most of the time on the ice to give him the puck, so I I, I became a, a playmaker. Which I wish I was. I was dreaming to be a Maurice Richard when I was <laughs> very young. I said, I'm going to score many goals, but that's one thing I didn't do. I didn't score too many. Henry, how much has the game changed? Obviously, the players are a lot bigger, they're a bit faster, they got newer equipment. Uh, there's so many changes in the game. But when you retired in 74, <laughs> that was the end of an era. Most fans thought Henry could play forever. You still look exactly the same as you did during your playing days. Not a, not a year has gone by, you, it seems. You, you, you wouldn't know you don't. You didn't know me then. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't alive. Yeah, I don't then. think you were alive. <laughs> I, I watched Henry Richard play for, for many years until your retirement. I used to go to every game at the Montreal Forum and you were my favorite hockey player for a different reason because I was very well, small and still am. Size. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, Henry Richard can succeed, well, yeah. you know, why not? But when you retired, it seemed like the end of an era. That No more Richards, Beliveau, all the guys were but then, the then there's, there's quite a few other guys that, you know, like, uh, like uh, Guy Lafleur that came, came up. I actually played uh, the last two, uh, two years with uh, Lafleur. <laughs> my last, actually my last game was with uh, Lafleur and uh, uh, Steve Schott in uh, was remember in, in Buffalo. Buffalo. The that's where I, that's where I broke my ankle actually in November. In and Washington. Then, and uh, no, I did, uh, st uh, against uh, against Buffalo. I think it was in no, it was in Montreal against Buffalo. Larry Carrier actually hit me behind the net and uh, that it used was an to bother accident. me so much in that in that series against the Sabres 74-75 they had all these big defensemen Jerry Korab mm -hmm. and they were constantly taking runs at, at little Henri Richard and there's nobody on the Canadians that did anything about it hmm. well uh, because at that time you remember Bobby Clark if anybody touched Bobby yeah, Clark right, at the Flyers right, right, they bring right. up the farm team from Hershey <laughs> the right, next time right, right. and it, 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 in fact after that that's when the Canadians got yeah, a little that, tougher yeah that wasn't well that wasn't a playoff I guess because <clears throat> I didn't come back till the playoff I hurt myself in November broke my ankle came back in uh, in the playoff uh, and we got beat against uh, by, uh, Buffalo I guess it was yeah. and then I always remember for the very first shift the game was held in, in uh, in, in, in uh, Buffalo, and uh, very first shift, he put me on against uh, Perro, the French connection, and I just couldn't believe it that he put me on because I, you know, I was just returned back. to, uh, didn't play for uh, five, six months. So, uh, that was and Scotty. then we went on to lose uh, Scotty Bowman. Yeah. Yeah. You also played a few years with uh, Kenny Dryden, who came up in 71. Right. And right. we talk a lot about, uh, the big joke is, if you retired every great former Canadian's number, They'd be have numbers in the hundreds right now. There'd be right. no numbers between, you know, between one and forty. Um, Ken Dryden is a number that wasn't retired, and it's been used by several players since since Ken Dryden. Was Ken one of the great Montreal Canadians? Oh yeah, Canadians? There, there's no doubt about that. He was a great, uh, a great goalie. But uh, you know, uh, he didn't play that long. Well, he played seven years, I guess he did. He was in his these in these seven years the best, the greatest in seven years. But uh, I think Jacques Plante in my mind is the best that I ever seen hmm. because he, he did quite a, quite a bit for hockey and he, he was quite a goalie, believe me. And uh, like I said, you were talking about Dryden, I agree that he was super, you know, that uh, well, thing coming back to that when Stanley Cup, we won in 1971, 72 against Boston and then Chicago. I think Dryden was because of him that we won. There's no, 
How much contact do you have with your former teammates, Ken Dryden, Guy Lafleur, and all the way back to Dickie Moore? And uh, well, well, I, see, I see Dickie quite a bit. Uh, the old timer, uh, the old timer room that we have at the forum. Uh, Ken, I see him once in a while in Toronto or when he comes to Montreal. And other guys, I see Guy Talbot, I see quite a bit. And then again, we meet. A lot of, we met. We meet a lot of uh, the old former hockey player in, uh, in our room there at the forum. Uh, you had a question about Keith Talbot, which was a... <coughs> yeah, I thought it was a pretty answer good trip. Well, <laughs> well, the answer's been given. Well, half the answer, actually, well, you know, I mean, everyone knows that 11 Stanley Cups is a record that, that may never be broken again. I don't think, I don't see a I team dominating so. the so. way the Montreal Canadiens did in the, during the Henri yeah. Richard era, but along for the ride on those great teams were some excellent defensemen, and two of them had each won eight Stanley Cups, which is a record for defensemen. jean Guy Talbot is one, and I already remembered that one. And the other one is Serge Savard, who played... Um, in the late 60s on a couple of cup winners and then throughout the 70s on those great teams with, right. with Ken Dryden. To win, to win eight Stanley Cups for a defenseman, is, is, it's quite phenomenal when you, uh, you consider the goaltenders. And he, and, and I already mentioned, I mean, Jacques Plant, there's a guy that Toronto fans hated because he was so good and he came up, always came up with the big save at the right time and eventually became a Toronto Maple Leaf. You know, different kind of a guy, strange guy, the whole thing, the whole story with the mask. I mean, there was an illusion about a Jacques Plante. People weren't sure what kind of a guy he was, but they knew he could certainly stop a puck. You know, and, and uh, when, in those days, if you didn't see the, fel the guy's face, like nowadays it's tough to recognize a player. In those days, if you didn't see the guy's face, you didn't know what kind of a player he was. No one wore helmets. You could tell, the, you know, you could look at his hockey card, look at the guy on TV. But Jacques Plante, there was a mysterious aura about Jacques Plante behind that mask. When no one else was wearing a mask, you know, Johnny Bauer didn't wear a mask in those days, and Glenn well, Hall didn't wear a mask in those nobody days. Nobody used to, nobody wore <coughs> a mask. That's how that's how Clown started right. that. And it's almost it, it almost made him better because he was more feared because you couldn't see an expression on his face. You can only see that mask. And was he a, sorry, was he a strange guy, Jacques Plante? I mean, by athletes' standards, was all goalie are strange. That's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like baseball <laughs> coaches, <and> catchers. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was uh, studying the Bernie Parra and uh, Billy Smith, and I was telling him. Telling these thing that uh, goalie are different. They're really different. Yeah, but, in, their but own, he, in their own ways. He was viewed in some areas, Jacques Plante, as, as a as a problem, as a malcontent, uh, lazy. Yeah, they call yeah, him very lazy. Very lonesome, man. lonesome guy. He never came out without go with the, all the players. Usually, we Montreal uh, we used to go all together after the game, and Jacques Plante was a lonely guy. He never used mm. to come. Well, that's very rarely. Who was your best friend on, on the Canadians teams? Then, uh, well, that was Claude Provo, that died uh, nine years ago now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, great check. Guitel, but Dickie Moore was a great friend of mine. We have a lot of fun. Were you? Cl what about the second wave of the Canadians teams that you played on the Stanley Cup winners of the late '60s and '70s? Uh, I'll you tell you, uh, as a good friend of mine, as uh, uh, Frank Mavlich, we were about the same age, and he came with Montreal and I used to hang around with Frank quite a bit. Another guy that bothers me. Now, that, that bothered me that Frank, Frank Mahovlich got away from the Maple Leafs. That was Punch Imlach's fault, right? Punch Imlach <laughs> would, would give Frank a hard time, called him Mahalovich on purpose <laughs> and called and said, you know, and, and Frank I think had, I mean, this was a nervous breakdown or yeah. close to it because of Punch Imlach. Punch ridiculed him in front of the other players in the press and thought he should be a better hockey player. Remember, Frank scored 48 goals in 61 or 62. And they, th you know, they say if you score that many goals one year, that you better be scoring that many yeah. goals every year. And he went down, and, and Punch really gave him a hard time. And in one of the biggest trades ever, in 1967, he traded you know, Mahovlich, Paul Henderson, Gary Unger to Detroit for uh, Norm Ullman, Floyd Smith. I'm sorry, Paul Henderson came from Detroit to mm -hmm. Toronto. But I mean, it was a huge ch trade, and then eventually he ended up with Montreal. And that was a great; those were great teams. Yeah. Frank Mahovlich, Peter Mahovlich. I mean, this, the the Canada Cup team of se or the '72 right. Canada team. Look at the Montreal Canadiens that represented that team. There was a, the middle of two eras almost. I mean, you were still playing, and uh, you know, and, okay. uh, Montreal made good trade uh, like that trade. Great trade. Frank from Detroit coming to Montreal. That's. The reason that we, another good reason that we won that that Stanley Cup. You with didn't. On our what, team. Sorry, Henry, you didn't play in '72. Did that bother you? Uh, the Russian series, the Canada Russia series, yeah. A, a little bit, you know. I, no, I I was close to be out of the game, and I uh, I just wish they would have asked me to train with them. Then I, I'm sure I would have made the team. In my mind, mm -hmm. well. I, We'll never know, but <laughs> in my mind, I want—I would have loved to go 
at least uh, asked Mr. Price just to, to go and tra in training camp with these guys. Was there a sense, Henry, just before the 72 series, while they were talking about it and preparing for it, that it could become as big as it did become? Did you know no, this is going to be a major world no, event? Not really. Hmm. No. I, I don't think anybody could tell about that. Uh, first of all, we thought that the, the Canadian would walk away with, uh, <laughs> with just all the games, which they didn't, as everybody knows. And you watched it with the same enthusiasm, I guess, as most hockey fans who weren't playing right, in the Right, and time. Uh, I think everybody remembers where they were at that time, the last Everyone. game. <coughs> yeah. Where were you? Were you at your bar? No, uh, we were in Halifax. Tra the training uh, camp. We training camp, yeah, we played. Sure, that's right, September, there, so. yeah. 72, yeah. 72, 73, yeah. 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 Hmm. I want to ask you a question about uh, watching as a former hockey player. I wonder if when you watch the old footage of goaltenders with no masks, we were talking about how hockey has changed, do you now say to yourself, I don't know how they did it? Well, nobody knows how they did it, but in our mind, you know, we, uh, we wouldn't try to hit the goalie, you know. They, today, they, they, sh they slap shot, they don't know where they're going. They slap all over, they know they won't hurt the goalie. Then we knew that if you hit them in the face, it would be, uh, could be tragic. And then that's, you know. So you were always conscious of the goalie we not wearing a mask? conscious, right, right. That's, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> Do you think players today have less of a lower threshold of pain and for injury? I mean, in those days, without the helmets and the masks, you would get cut during a game, you would go to the bench or you would go off to the clinic, they'd sew it up, and you'd be back out there playing in the next period. Um, now, with all the equipment and everything else, it seems a player will stay on the ice longer. A trainer has to come out to get him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, has it changed that? I mean, these, the players are bigger and stronger. I wish, I wish you wouldn't mention that. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, was I, there, did I, I agree so much with you. I couldn't believe. And I don't think in my 20 years that I played pro with Monarch, and I don't think, I don't believe I stayed on the ice. I broke an ankle, broke. A shoulder, broken arm. Came and, off the ice. And I just got up to, and I went yeah. out to, on my knees. Limp to the bench, right? The bench. <laughs> and they call, and they call him that. Little Henry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how much is it, do you think TV has to do? Everybody knows his cameras are on. Yeah, it, uh, it could be. But so if the cameras were on, if the cameras are on, you wouldn't want the camera to catch you lying on the ice. No. Well, I guess so. You I want the camera to get you going right. off the ice. <laughs> it's like right. the guy in baseball. When you get hit by a pitch, you never rub the spot right. where you got hit. You don't want anyone to know you're hurt. Until the you next run hitter's off up. the first base. Until the next yeah. hitter's up. That's right. That's right. Nobody that's notices then. Yeah, that's but true. And then you rub. The <laughs> that's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, I find that, uh, you know, that a lot of cases recently, is especially, almost like in soccer, where the guy will try to draw a foul and he'll be in writhing in agony on the field. In hockey, we, we've gotten more of that. And it happened the other night, too, and I'm trying to think who it was. Um, where um, one of the uh, Kings players appeared to be hurt. Luke Robitaille got knocked down, okay. and then and he was lying there, and they didn't blow the whistle, and he got up after about 10 seconds and got right back into the play, and the fans all went, yeah, you weren't hurt. Interesting. Yeah. interesting you weren't hurt. Interesting you mentioned Luke Robitaille, because uh, prior to game one, Luke Robitaille apparently looked into the stands and saw, I shouldn't say the ghost of Henri Richard, Henri Richard. because uh, yeah. he's very much alive. Yes. He saw Henri Richard, but saw the ghost of Henri Richard's achievements pass and said, I can't disappoint Henri Richard. Henri Richard is going to be watching this game. All the accomplishments that someone like Henri has had in this forum is going to pump me up to play better. Yeah, so you, many times we talk him. about yeah, we talk about players who come in here and get intimidated by the ghosts of the Canadians past, mm -hmm. but Luke Robitaille came in and said, I'm not going to be intimidated by it, I'm going to live up to. Yeah. Had that feel to know that Luke Robitaille was actually that, looking at Henri Richard. Yeah, yeah, that's what he, yeah he was time. inspired by oh, you, yeah. absolutely. Well, actually, you were his I, favorite. I, I, I saw him uh, I was at the uh, the, the warm-up there before the game. That's what he's talking and about. And then he was talking to some people. I was right behind the bench of Montreal, just talking to people. And he looked at me and said, he said Hi. that's all, that, that was it. Any players call you Mr. Richard? Yeah, that, w that w makes me pretty uh, <laughs> old. <laughs> <laughs> but but isn't, were, uh, isn't it a thrill when they come up to you, though, to, the, to, to be recognized still? Oh yeah, by uh, today's sure, players. Sure, yeah, I mean, it is a job, but uh, you know, there's a lot of kids, five, six years, uh, six, seven, ten years old. They know me because of the uh, hockey, hockey, card, hockey yeah. card. But now, now they come to me and said, uh, "Could I have an autograph of my grandfather?" I don't mind when they say their father. <laughs> 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 you had a very successful uh, business establishment on Park Avenue. Mark used to frequent it quite a bit. He used to live in the area. I used to, I used to have some yeah. meals there. Uh -huh. A lot of former Canadians went into that. Business. Oh yeah, uh, former and uh, pre present uh, yeah. hockey player. Then when I the team, uh, you know, I had that in, uh, from 1960 to had that 26 years. So uh, I invite the player every time we won the Stanley Cup. They all came to my place. Even when we lost, they came after the uh, season. So 
I had that for 20, 26 years and six months, actually. So what was it that made, was it a tie-in with Molson that made it easy, or what was it with so many players ending up no, running, running an establishment all, no, like not that? No, not at all, because I, you know, I, you know, as a kid, I dreamed to play hockey. I dreamed to play with Montreal Canadian. I wanted to have a tavern. I don't know why, because I knew I, I wouldn't go to school, and I, the tavern would be easy to, to run. <laughs> So, uh, and I dreamed, to, not I dream, I, as a kid, I, I wanted to marry the wife that I'm, my wife that I'm still married with. I was six years old when I met her. Wow. And I married her. <laughs> Childhood sweetheart. <laughs> right. Let's be serious though, Mitch. If you're going to open a tavern, it better be Henri Richard, Jacques Lemaire, Yvon Cornway. I yeah. mean, Patrice Brisebois Tavern, I don't think <laughs> would have the same effect today. No offense to Patrice or Eric Desjardins or uh, yeah. any of the president. Or even if Larry Hillman had opened the tavern. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would have done very well. <laughs> no, you know what happened? It would move every two years to another city. <laughs> That's right. right? A suitcase. What, what about a donut? But Tim, Tim, Tim Horton. Horton. Yeah, yeah, you know what's funny is they're in the States, Tim Horton Donuts, and people, yeah. I mean, the name Tim Horton means virtually nothing to a lot of people, yeah. but you go to Florida yeah. and it's Tim Horton's Donuts, and yeah. it's like, And they who? don't know the guy. And he never know. lived to see how big it had it's become. Unbelievable. That's unbelievable. That's too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's really, it's just uh, something to talk about all the old players, I and mean, shouldn't call them the old players, but you show up at the Montreal Forum and you see how the fans react to you, and you see how they swarm around you, and then you got a guy like Roby Ty, it's funny, you know, he sees you and it's like, He's, he's intimidated by you almost, but when you see Wayne and Mario, are you taken aback by some of the things that they can do on the ice? They're impressed to see you, but are you impressed to see them? Oh, I'm impressed to see them for sure. Believe me, those guys are unbelievable. The guy Wayne Gretzky, Mario Lemieux, they're over everybody else. Anybody who's played as long as you, you gotta, you probably answered the question a zillion times, but we gotta ask you before we leave, Orr, Harvey, the Rocket, Howe, Gretzky Lemieux, hmm. if you had to pick the best ever, all around player. Let's eliminate the rocket. Forget about yeah, the rocket. Yeah, well, the best all around before Wayne Gretzky came in, and it was Bobby Orr. Hmm. I had to go with Bobby Orr. Uh, great, the greatest hockey player that I ever. And then Wayne Gretzky after came in, and then Mario Lemieux came in. So uh, those three guys are best. The best hockey player that I've seen. We got 30 seconds. I have Mark. a question, Henri. You seem to me most players, former players, are bitter for one reason or another about the money that the new guys are making or the success that they have. You don't appear. You, in fact, yeah. you're the opposite. You appear. No. You appear to be the type of guy who uh, wishes them all the best and uh, and uh, hopes that the sport that you played and you made your living from continues to flourish. I think that's great. Yeah, believe me, I don't. Uh, money is not everything in life. I guess uh, if. If you're happy, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm a millionaire because I do what I want to do and I don't need the money. Of course, you need money, but uh, uh, being alive and being in good health is the main thing. Henri Richard, continued good health, and this has been thank you. more than a thrill, I think, for all of us. For Mitch Melnick, Mark Hepscher, and Henri Richard, thank you very much for watching the Sports Hot Seat, and we'll catch you on the very next edition. Sports Hot Seat is brought to you in part by Sport Buff in Plaza Alexis Neon, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear.
Sports Hot Seat is brought to you in part by Sport Buff in Plaza Alexis Neon, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear. Welcome to the Sports Hot Seat, Mitch Garber with Mitch Melnick, and today joining us in studio, two of the top people in sports television in this country, apart from the two of us, of course, Mitch, <laughs> CFCF Sports Director Ron Roosh, and Global Television's Mark Hebsher. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for Thank calling you. us gentlemen. That's very nice. <laughs> uh, I use the term loosely, especially with Hebsher. Uh, uh, I don't know where you want to start. You want to start Montreal, Toronto? You want to start television sports? Uh, we're leaving this up to you guys. Oh, You, you guys are used to talking. Uh, all right. TV sports sounds good to me. Sure, right? It's pretty interesting. Really interesting subject. Really. All right, let me let me ask you right off the top. Uh, who who do you consider your competition? Radio, newspapers, national television shows. Hmm. I th I think that uh, with the advent in, in in our business in the sports business with the advent of TSN, it's changed the way we do things locally. And uh, uh, we, we don't spend as much time, uh, especially in the, within the news framework. Uh, Mark has a different situation in Toronto. Within the, within the uh, context of the, uh, the news show, we try to do things differently now. We try to keep things local. That's the one thing that TSN can't do. Uh, sometimes we'll ignore, for instance, a French Open or something because we know TSN's covering that and, and it'll get within their show and sacrifice perhaps that for some local stuff. It, 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 the business is changing. It's constantly changing anyway. It's a crazy business, television, and, uh, but that area is, uh, I think, where, uh, where things are changing most right now. Yeah, our situation is, I think, different, Ron. The reason you mentioned, uh, instead of going more local, we find that, uh, for example, TSN makes our job easier more people are in tune with sports because there is a TSN. There are 190 Blue Jay games and 600 hockey games. So if there's sports on every night, then people have an insatiable appetite for sports. And our program, which is a 30-minute show, which runs from 11.30 to midnight in Ontario, goes up against TSN's show. So rather than TSN taking viewers away from us, more people tune to our program. We like them. We, we love them. And the fact that they can't cover the local and regional stuff like we can, the same thing in Montreal, we know that people in Calgary are upset at them. They call them the Toronto Sports Network. So we know that our audience is secure and they may watch half an hour of TSN and then flip to us. And I think the same thing happens in Montreal. People who are real sports fans want to watch CFCF sports and maybe they want to check out TSN and make fun of them because they didn't cover the Montreal story the way they thought they should because they're based in Toronto. It happens a lot. A lot, mm -hmm. sure. And, but out west, I know for a fact out west, they really dislike TSN because they're all based in Toronto. They have one guy in Vancouver, one guy in Edmonton, one guy in Winnipeg, Calgary, and the rest is pretty much Toronto stuff. And uh, uh, I think you guys have the edge in Montreal, certainly, Ron. If I, when I'm here, I like to watch the Montreal angle. I don't want to see people from Toronto talking about what they think's going on in Montreal. You know, that bothers me. The yeah. only place you can get the Montreal yeah. angle, of course, is, is here in Montreal because, as mentioned, you can't get that angle uh, on TSN. But talking about TSN, it's funny because we just started talking about TV sports. The very first thing that comes up is TSN. Let's talk mm. about the network that gave birth to TSN, which is ESPN. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the two of you saw ESPN for the first time, I'm not sure how many years ago, probably mm. around 12, you must have known then that TV sports was going to change for both of you forever. No. Uh, I didn't think it was going to work, <laughs> to be honest Sorry. with you. I mean, that shows how much I know. Uh, if, if somebody had offered me a job at, at uh, ESPN, I wouldn't have taken it at that time. And, and there were people like Sal Marciano who started work there and, mm -hmm. then, and then left them because he thought it was going to be a failure. Uh, it's been such a monstrous success that, uh, I mean, ABC invested in this thing. Now it has become an adjunct of their, their own network. Uh, and, and maybe the most profitable arm of ABC. It's incredible what ESPN has done, but also the most successful broadcasting organization in Canada is TSN. It's making more money than any broadcast operation, including the regular networks, uh, uh, specifically C CTV. It, it, it's just, it's incredible what's happened there. So they're making the money, but they're not spending it, some people yeah. think, in the right ways. But, uh, yeah, it's like... Uh, and, and do they have to spend it? It's the old line again. No, uh, they're, they're, they're not going to lose their viewers, I don't no. think, if they no, cut it's, back. No, it's, so. it's a captive audience it's right now, and, and 
it, it, it's, a, it's a monstrous success. Uh, it's great for us because, as Mark says, it's, it's it heightened the, the desire for more. I don't know when this is going to end. We used to talk back in the 50s about how Friday night television killed boxing. Mm. Somewhere along the line, one thinks that the, 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 the goose is going to die here, but uh, it hasn't yet, except perhaps in baseball. And uh, I, um, it just seems like uh, sports is clearly the most uh, popular form of entertainment uh, in North America, and, uh, and uh, it just keeps growing. Yeah. I don't know. Rotisserie leagues, too, I think, have uh, made a real difference. You know, people who weren't sports fans, suddenly they're in rotisserie leagues where they have the NFL pool in the office, and they have this desire to have more and more knowledge about sports. <clears throat> the more you can give them, the more they want to know. Yeah. And, what, uh, what a, yeah, sorry, but what about the style in which sports and television is presented now? We, we were talking coming over in the car, Mark, about uh, entertainment tonight. Very slick show. And it seems that a lot of organizations are modeling their, their uh, shows on, on what's done in entertainment tonight. Hasn't this spawned a whole generation of people, and you can, you can blame maybe MTV for it as mm -hmm. well, uh, you know, with the, with the remote, no attention span. I had a young cousin of mine. I urged him to watch Treasure of Sierra Madre, and uh, eight minutes in, he was asleep. <laughs> 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 it was the black and white that did it. Uh, I think that uh, what I don't I don't think it's an entertainment tonight thing. I think entertainment tonight is the product of of the technology. Entertainment tonight is a spinoff from sports. Sports has yeah. established almost all of the technical all the techniques that are being used and news and everything else came out of sports. Uh, the graphic looks, the yeah. everything else. Uh, I like to call it the Rune Arledge effect. Arledge started all, all of this stuff when he was working at ABC Sports, carried it over into ABC News, and that carried ABC News to number one, and now everybody else is following it. Entertainment Tonight has just taken the technology, the graphic technology that exists in, in, uh, in the business now, and they have, uh, have made it into a, an entertainment show rather than a sports show. That's, that's the only thing. I mean, they like to say it's the entertainment tonight look. I don't think so. It's a sports look. It's, it's slick, taken. though. It's People slick, like slick. slick. I mean, look, on yeah. television, we were discussing this before, and uh, this is a rare occasion where <clears throat> people don't want to see a talking head for any more than 15 seconds. Show us the action. It's TV. We want the video. Mm. So uh, on our show, for example, on Sportsline, on Ron's show, depending on how much time you have, you want to give them, you want to give them the highlights. If you go to 100 fans and say, do you want highlights or do you want interviews? 95 of them are going to say, give me the action. Give me the highlights. The interviews we can get on radio, we can read them in, uh, in the newspaper. So it's, it's highlight driven, it's highlight oriented. And if you're going to do highlights and it's sports, you've got you've to sound pretty excited about it. I mean, you know, occasionally on TSN or on the CBC, it's, uh, oh, well, here's a match point. And uh, <laughs> hey, come on, it's, hey, look at this. It's match point. It's exciting. This is the French Open. It's the final. You know, let's get some action. And that's why, for example, ESPN, people like Chris Berman, it's a whole new generation of sportscaster. It's, you're past the Ray Scott type of guy. Yeah. Packer ball, first and ten, and let the, let, you know, let the picture tell the story. You want to enhance the video with, with punchy commentary, with, with personality, because if you can't incorporate personality into sports, you got a problem. It's not like news where it's brain surgery or something. This is just sports, so let's have some fun with it. If the Canadians played a terrible game, we should be able to say, hey, they stunk the joint out. Hmm. Whereas in the newspapers, you know, they don't want to exactly write it that way or... You know, if, if I say they stunk the joint out, I may say it with a bit of a twinkle in my eye, a bit of tongue in cheek, and the viewer will know that I'm sort of half kidding. You can't do that the same way in, t in, in newspaper. You can only do it to an extent in radio because they can't see your facial expression. It's just sports. <laughs> Hence the jealousy from a lot of newspaper people towards well, television. Well, that's, that's longstanding, though. I, 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 find, I find that part of it... Um, Diminishing somewhat, uh, newspapers. Uh, so many of them are now employed they, by TV. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. First, first of all, uh, but uh, I, I mean, I, I can remember when I first got in the business, which was in '58. Uh, the newspaper people wouldn't talk to radio people. Mm -hmm. Television was not a, a factor. It was radio that concerned them all the time, and uh, uh, they were. They, I mean, they they could hardly wait to take their shots. Uh, you know, because they considered them as a, as competition for advertising, and they took it seriously. Well. As times progressed, some of the old timers still exist in this in this mold. But I, I think most of the new people in the newspaper business uh, have adjusted to the fact that we're different industries. We do things differently. We have a different uh, a mandate. I think reporting may be the, the common thread, but uh, what a newspaper guy does is uh, more in depth than we can do. I can do, for instance, in my seven or eight minutes that I get my sportscast at six o'clock. Uh, my, uh, just picking up on what Mark just said, uh, 
uh, unlike a half hour show, I have to compress everything into, into the framework of, the, of Pulse. Uh, so, for instance, I, I won't show the full highlights. I may take a thread of, of the game, the Expos. Like a couple of nights ago, uh, the Expos were in Houston. And uh, I, uh, I only used one play, Caminiti's play behind uh, third yeah, base, where he made the, made the catch to save uh, save the tie there. It was the, and it was the final out of the game. And then went to a number of great plays that were made in other games. They, I mean, it's it's like yeah. manna to the <clears throat> brain. I mean, I, I've always said that one of the dullest things you can show is a dribbling ground ball. Uh, between first and second that scores a run or a sacrifice Sac fly, fly that scores, <laughs> the, worst score. so scores the winning run scores the winning run of the ball game the hell with it get it out of there I mean I, I'm not even interested in showing it give me uh, a Mike Lansing uh, making a great play yeah. behind yeah. third base be even, if, even if the right. Expos lost the game that is more interesting I think uh, right. from a viewer standpoint they say oh hey yeah. you know with, with seven, and, and I'll with, string a bunch of those together uh, yeah. for for a minute and a half, two minutes, rather than than yeah. trying one highlight package. A big hit as opposed to an ugly goal. Well, with yeah. seven with seven minutes of a sportscast, you have no choice. I'm a bit younger than the three of you, so I've. <laughs> I've <laughs> and I'm a bit younger than. 1958. Him. Uh, I grew up. I'm growing up in the cable age. Uh -huh. And you mentioned that when you saw ESPN for the first time, you thought it wouldn't happen. That's because they had looking, monster trucks all the time. That's all they had. We're, exactly, but monster we're at rodeo. Right? We're looking 10 years into the future now, and we're becoming a cable society. They right. project 300, 500 cable stations. The network news, like CFCF Pulse, which is the local news, global television, where are we going to be heading now? Already, there are so many choices. We don't get ESPN here. We get mm. CNN, Sports Tonight. And in Toronto, they get Global, they get TSN, and they get whatever other network, CBC, and whatever else they have over mm. there. We're heading to many more stations. Well, the, the, the quote on that's the cable word, the death stars, but uh, um, mainly because they think it's going to be the death of them. ESPN will be available here when, when this technology arrives, which is supposed to be next year. Hmm. Uh, Scary thought. We're all, we're all, but I still say that, that Pulse is always going to exist because it does something that those people can't do, and that's cover the local scene. And it's up to us to give uh, the people here what they want, and they still want local, and they still want to know about their teams. And uh, so here in Montreal, for instance, TSN doesn't spend a lot of time worrying about the Expos or the, or the, or the, uh, the Canadians. They pay, pay lip service to them the same as they pay to the Winnipeg Jets. And uh, so uh, they will always be able to give them. So from, from the standpoint of the private stations and, and private sportscasters, we're going to be all right. Uh, the networks, I don't know what's going to happen with networks. I think, I think that the, the business, uh, uh, network business, is, going, is, is very much in jeopardy. Yeah, Inter interesting story, interesting point that Ron's making about staying local and, and true as it is. Nobody else is covering Montreal the same way that Pulse is, especially not in English, with no mm. CBC Sports, local news uh, sports. But Mark, you were in Montreal for the Stanley Cup final, which Toronto, unfortunately for your fans, yeah. are not in, right. which is Montreal, Los Angeles. Yeah. If you're staying just local in a few years from now, they may not be sending you here. You no. may not be sending someone to the Super Bowl or to the World Series if the Expos mm -hmm. aren't in it. Maybe the Blue Jays are in it, you might send somebody there. Yeah, but let's say the Expos weren't in it, but uh, there were three guys from the Montreal area or the province of Quebec playing for the Houston Astros, mm -hmm. and they were in the World Series. You You'd go. go. You have to go. Same way here in uh, Montreal, um, there are several guys from the province of Ontario, not only on the Canadians, but on the Kings. Their families watch. Uh, Global carries 35 Maple Leaf games a year, which means that we're, people know to turn to our state, tune to our station, or at least to our sportscasts, to get hockey. Now, I've had hockey players come up to me that I'd never met before, and they're from the States saying, hey, I watch your show. They've seen it, they've heard about it, they know we have half an hour, and during hockey season, we have highlights of all the games. And as good as ESPN is, they don't cover hockey the way we do. Um, and I don't think TSN covers hockey the way we do either. I mean, we know what the fan wants. Give us the action, give us the goals, give us the hits, tell us every guy who got a goal and an assist. Then we can go to sleep happy and not have to worry about getting up at 6 in the morning to grab the newspaper to check the summaries. And like I say, um, of, I don't, and I don't know what percentage it is, but I've got to believe that 8 out of 10 people who watch our show have some interest in who got the last goal of the game. And... You know, more or the or the guy who plays like Paul Di Pietro maybe is a relative of a friend, and he met him before. I mean, it's incredible the number of people that know of a guy playing in the NHL or are friends with his family, and because of that, there's the local tie-in right there. And you'll never lose that. And you're right, ESPN, TSN, whoever will never be able to do that and say, oh, there's a local guy from from uh, Il Perot, and he's yeah. When a player blasts Jacques Demers <clears throat> next year, and it's going to happen, mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to be on ESPN. 
<laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. And people are going to want to turn to Pulse to find out what happened. Yeah. 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 Because, uh, you know, we'll, we'll either have it, if, yeah. if it appears, it'll be because they pirated some of our footage or, uh, you know, but l the likelihood of uh, we would have it first yeah. anyway. So, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. Talk about the difference. I don't want to hear about the closing time in Toronto is 1 a.m. Forget about that. <laughs> Forget about the restaurants and the people and the sexiness of Montreal as a city. But talk about sports from a sports point of view. The difference, because Mark, you spent some time in Montreal. Yeah. I don't think Montreal there's a, and Toronto. I don't think there's a great difference because the fans are loyal when it comes to hockey. I mean, they expect more in Montreal. Obviously, I heard the great, the best expression, and we mentioned this on radio the other day, Mitch. People were complaining the Habs hadn't been in the finals in, in the finals in four years. I mean, Toronto hadn't been in the playoffs <laughs> in that long. So there's one great, uh, great equalizer, and that is um, the fan expects what has happened you know in recent years if the team has been successful the fan expects that success to carry on if the team has been unsuccessful the fan hopes that they can reach that next level in Toronto it's making the playoffs in Montreal it's winning the cup it's been like that for a number of years however with baseball the Expos had their chance 79 80 81 they, they, they got close they haven't been close since they've teased the fans consequently that's why 11,000 show up at Olympic Stadium at, during the same time period, the Blue Jays were getting better and better every year, knocking on the door. They won a division in 85. So between 85 and 92, when they finally won the World Series, it was expected that they would win. It's like the Canadians, very similar. We expect you to be, and if you don't finish first, you better finish second, and you better be good next year and go and get the best players. So there's your parallel. Toronto's baseball fans, uh, with Montreal's hockey fans, with one exception, Toronto's <laughs> baseball fans, it wouldn't matter if it was baseball or soccer. If they're a winner, they'll show up. Hockey, it doesn't matter. They could, be, they could put elephants on skates and they'd fill Maple Leaf Gardens because it's hockey. Yeah. And that's still the number one sport in this country and it always will be no matter how successful the Blue Jays or Expos get. We'll never turn out as many baseball players as we will hockey players. It just won't happen. The, uh, I, I, there's a very simple reason for the difference between Montreal and, and, and Toronto in this population. I, you know, you always used to, Red Sullivan, uh, when I was in Kitchener, uh, had come down, he was the former captain of the New York Rangers. And uh, I think he's in the Philly organization. He right? is, yeah. yeah. Great guy. And uh, Red was playing coach in Kitchener in the old Eastern Pro Hockey League. And, and I was talking to Red one time about uh, hockey in New York. And I said, geez, you know, you got to fill that building. And it was terrific. He says, you know what? There are 15,000. Hockey fans in New York. They come to the game. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Nobody else. <laughs> it's 15,000. Well, you got a population in those days of 10 million or 8 right. million people. Not, not and they, and there's, there's 15,000. I mean, you, you could draw 15,000, I suppose, in New York to. Uh, to watch a couple of fleas go across the table there, yeah. you know. I mean, and if you could bet on it, certainly you would. And, 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 and but, but that's the situation in Toronto now. You've got 10 million people in southern Ontario now in that golden yeah. horseshoe. You thing. got it. And, and if you can't fill a stadium, when, you, when you're drawing from a population like that, when you're the only game in town, which basically the Blue Jays are in the, in the summertime, mm. uh, then there's something wrong. And, and certainly if you're a winner, which the Blue Jays have been for the last few years. The Expos, on the other hand, I would think are on the verge of getting back to what they were in the early 70s, which is around 2.3, 2.4. I talked to Claude Brochu a couple of, uh, about a year ago about this, and he said the maximum attendance we think we can get here is around 2.4. Hmm. Drawing from the population, you're basically drawing from Montreal, which is uh, yeah. 2.5, 3 million people, and Ottawa. You, you haven't got a Buffalo. You've got Plattsburgh, New York. Yeah. You, you haven't got uh, London, Kitchener, Guelph. Uh, sure, uh, yeah, all Burlington. Of that. You uh, any, Oshawa, you know. Hamilton. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, you're right, Ron. So, Within so, two hours of Toronto, it's phenomenal the number of people who are available. So uh, from a population base of, say, uh, 3.5 million, you draw 2.5 million with a good team. Right. In Toronto, from 10 million, you draw 4 million. But what if what they played in Skydome? What if, what if the Expos played in a place like Skydome? Uh, I mean, yeah, a lot of people go to Skydome, not for the ball game, yeah. just to be at Skydome. Sure. It's well, a great that's, place, that's, the Jumbotron. Well, they put 40,000 in there for cheers. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the uh, yeah, that, that's the phenomenon I think yeah. is, is is the stadium. Yeah, it's it a terrific place. Well, that, I mean, Sky Dome is is certainly one element, but something has happened between Toronto and Montreal. You didn't discuss the language difference either, which is plays another factor. There's, there's population, there's there's language, and several other factors. But Toronto 
has Americanized over the last 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. They have the number one indoor outdoor stadium in the world, mm -hmm. a tremendous baseball team. It may be true that out of the 50,000 that go to Skydome, you've got 40,000 socialites and 10,000 fans. That's okay, it's still 50,000 people. It's absolutely true. They Does have the same 15,000 that are in New York that are hockey fans. They've got maybe maybe twice that in Toronto that really know, but I'm talking about, mm. there's 20,000 people in Toronto that could tell you exactly what the infield fly rule is. No, no, there's 10,000. <laughs> yeah. What's the infield, whereas in hockey, you ask any fan, any six-year-old kid to explain a two-line offside, or, no problem. But baseball, the infield fly rule, you go through Skydome and say, okay, what is it? You would, people don't know. They don't, and they don't, wouldn't know where the cutoff man would stand if the right fielder was trying to throw the, get a guy out at third base. It's like Los Angeles. L.A., people come to the, to the game, and they leave in the seventh inning. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, tie game. Yeah. Right. Perfect game. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. 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 And he, uh, he said they were investigating seriously putting the NBA in here, and then they, d they decided not to do it. Uh, I think the NBA would go here. I think that it would go, it's, it's, it would go anywhere they put it. They could put it in Guelph. You're probably and, right, and, yeah. And it would go because the NBA has become a phenomenon. It's the fastest growing. Uh, uh, but they'll go league. to Toronto, Ron, and they won't come to Montreal. Hmm. A lot of fans may think that the NBA will come here in the next five, ten years. Oh, the I NBA don't think will not have a franchise in Montreal. No, Why? I if we could fill well, the who's, forum, who's the new pay forum, hundred million dollars. Right. Well, assuming Never mind that. To what the about table? dates? What, what, what else besides the forum? Is there another arena they could play in? The NBA? Well, they're going to play in. The, they would play in the new forum. I would. Fine. Imagine. If they play in the new forum, what are they? They're going to get Saturday nights? No. They're going to get Friday nights. I mean, you know, what about dates? And what, what happens if Montreal's in? What happens if they book Sting and the Ice Capades? <laughs> I, I mean, that's the, to me, that's the biggest well, joke going all of a sudden, well, we're going to be skating at Gigagnon this week because Sting is at the Forum, and then we got the Michael Jordan and the Bulls coming. So, you know, we but relegate that's, that's, the house. That's, that's common. That happens all over the country it, and all over the states, too, it, where they share hockey rinks I'm and, I'm and basketball rinks. I'm surprised rinks. the Kings can get in their own <clears> building because uh, yeah. I remember when Brian O'Neill used to do the scheduling for the NHL, he used to say that, they, they, you know, you have 40 home dates, and he'd get 42 dates from right. L.A., so he had two to play with. The Lakers and how many shows in the LA Forum? Well, it's booked oh, every night. Well, they've already, I mean, they've already had to change uh, the, the $200,000. They had to pay the World Ice Skating Championships or whatever scheduled for the LA Forum on the night of the sixth game of the Stanley Cup Finals. They mm -hmm. had to pay $200,000 to the Ice Capades people to say, look, take a walk, we need the hockey game here. Then they battled, McNall battled with the NHL. The NHL said, Bruce, you pay him the 200 grand. And Bruce said, no, you pay him the 200 grand. So I think they got together with Dr. Jerry Buss, made an arrangement to, you know, to, to, to because Saturday, it would be Saturday night, game seven, ESPN wants to cover it live across the country. Hockey Night in Canada wants it. Money talks. Mm. Yeah, well, money, t money doesn't talk, it swears. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, you're talking about possible NBA franchise. The, the, where's the money in Montreal? Look how long it took to get a, an ownership group for the Expos. Yeah. And where's the, yeah. where's the Quebec no, money no, no as opposed to Toronto? Money, right? I'm more concerned about football. Ever since football left Montreal, you know, the CFL, and, you know, in this world, you know, the league was great, but I mean, there's something missing. You know, the, 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 to think that the Canadian Football League is really Canadian without a franchise east of uh, Ottawa really bothers me a lot. Because I remember knowing all the players for the Alouettes or the Concords, whoever, but I'm mean, knowing them by number. Oh, there's Peter Dallariva, number 74, Dickie Harris, Randy Ryan, number 20. So that, that's gone. We, they've lost a generation of football fans. They tried to bring them back with Rocket Ismael and all this, you know, Doug Flutie. That's great, lasted for two years. But I'm seriously concerned about the future of football in this country. And what's this country do over the course of a summertime? You know, if it's the Expos and Jays and that's all there is, there's going to be even more emphasis on baseball and less on football. I think we're neglecting one, one major point. The fans in Montreal are not great fans. Talk about having a, a, <laughs> a world title fight. Matthew Hilton and Buster Drayton, you did that fight, Ron. Mm -hmm. How many people were there? 5,000 paid at the Montreal Forum for yeah. a world title fight. It was a good fight, too. Yeah. He yeah. fought Wilfredo Benitez there, Vito Antoaformo there. Yeah. Um, the Olympic Stadium has its problems for baseball. The only team that can attract is the Montreal Canadiens. And, and when the Canadiens weren't, when they were a mediocre hockey team, they were given 1,000 tickets away. We don't, have fans here, we don't have fans here that think it's cool to show up for a game, an expo game, just to go to a baseball game, to yeah. go to a world title fight. They won't go. And if they won't go, you have a hard time coming up with a hundred million. Maybe if these fans were as interested in coming out just to be together at a sporting event, to go out and watch Cheers on a Jumbotron, 
Yeah. Someone would come up with that hundred million. No, that's no, I don't know. No, no, no. Indication of what the fans should be doing. No, in Montreal. Look, first of all, show first of all, this guy known for cheers. There's, I mean, being <laughs> being a, a spirit, that's being a spirit, Torontonian and enjoying visiting Montreal, I can tell you a reason. If someone said to me, "I'm in Montreal for three days," someone says, "Let's go see the Expos." I don't want to go. They got great restaurants here, fabulous shows, phenomenal clubs that are open late. Why would I want to go and waste two and a half hours at a at a baseball game? I can catch the highlights on Ron's show <laughs> when I can go out and experience the city of Montreal. Now, the difference with Toronto is, in Toronto, you work your 9 to 5 or whatever. Now, what do you do for excitement in Toronto? Places are closed early. If you want to go for dinner on a Friday, Saturday night, you better be there by 8 o'clock. Forget about it. So, ba going to a game, baseball, hockey, a fight, whatever, is more in tune with what people in Toronto do. They go for an early dinner, then they go to the ballpark or the rink, then they're home by 11 o'clock and asleep by 11.30 or 12.00. And in Montreal, it's different. In Montreal, you go to the game, then you go for dinner, right? If you go to the game at all. And I think there's just too many things to do around here than just go off to the Olympic Stadium. We, really got, we got a couple of minutes here. Uh, your all-time favorite athlete that you've interviewed over the years and your all-time worst. My favorite interview. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Mm. I can tell you who my favorite is. Muhammad Ali was the absolute greatest. Captivating, yeah. completely captivating. I don't remember what I asked him. I remember he remembered my name, which was great, answering my, saying, well, That's Mark, important. well, Mark, you know, Muhammad <laughs> Ali. And also, I couldn't get over the fact that, I couldn't get over the fact that, I mean, I was sitting next to this guy who, you know, it, it was amazing to me. I mean, he was larger than life. And everyone in the world knew who he was. You just had to say Ali, and they all knew who Ali was. And that, to me, he was wonderful, he was gracious, and he knew my name. He was the best. Yeah. The worst. Ron, you do your best, and I'll think of my worst. My, my best will probably date me, Sterling Moss. Oh, okay. It was a tremendous, nice. tremendous interview, a captivating man, uh, uh, one of those people that, that draws people to him when he's in a room, uh, very much like Ali, uh, but I think, I think probably uh, he would be the, the one, the, the, the interview that I probably remember the most. My worst, I nearly had a fist fight with Mike Schmidt one, oh. one afternoon in, in Philadelphia. This guy got to be so sour at the end of his career. And uh, I, finally I said to him, I said, Mike, if you hate this so much, get out. Get out of the game, which really got me in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he really, but but uh, I, I, got sick, I, you know, I get sick and tired of him. Maybe I should just say most baseball players. <laughs> yeah, today, unfortunately. <laughs> I would agree with most baseball 20 seconds. players. Most yeah. baseball players, for sure. The worst guy I ever did was Mike Milbury. Disliked the man intensely. Yeah. Um, he, I mean, this is a guy who, if the team won, he was great. And if they lost, you better not ask any questions. Yeah. So I asked the question when they lost, and he gave it to me, the four-letter words. Folks from start, you never see Ron Roosh's boots on Pulse. So, Ron, can, can we, we show me a, a, can we, there they are. Of, uh, Look at this. Incredible what boots. What is this? Wow. Those are uh, ostrich. Wow. Oh, ostrich. <laughs> do, they go, do they stick their, your feet in the yeah, sand? Yeah, no, time? I do, though. <laughs> gentlemen, Thanks a lot. Gentlemen, thank you very, very gentlemen, much. That's three gentlemen. Three gentlemen. Ron Roosh. Sports Director at CFCF Television, and Mark Hepscher from Global Television, Sports Line Show in Toronto. For Mitch Melnick, I'm Mitch Garber, welcoming you back to another edition of the Sports Hot Seat. See you next time. Sports Hot Seat is brought to you in part by Sport Buff in Plaza Alexis Neon, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear.
Sports Hot Seat is brought to you in part by Sport Buff in Plaza Alexis Neon, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear. Welcome back to the Sports Hot Seat, and as we wind down this season, we return to a couple of guests that we've had since the very beginning of the Sports Hot Seat. Our very first guest is back again with us today, Mitch. The uh, general manager of the Montreal Expos, coming off an executive of the year performance, Dan Duquette, and our buddy from CIQC, host of the new show Play at the Plate, which follows Expos broadcast, and the afternoon news anchor on CIQC, Terrence Haig. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> now, just to show you how far Mr. Duquette has come, can we get a shot of our very first show when, uh, look at this, look at that attire, very casual. Now let's look at Mr. Duquette today after a shopping spree somewhere. Hey, if we can go, if there. we can look what, at that. What is this? If we can look at that how picture. About this? There. There now. The oh, no. Like no, that. No, no, <laughs> no, I'm more in line with my host. George Shearing. <laughs> if you George Shearing. <laughs> there it is. Do the interview like that. All right. Absolutely. You first of all, first, better, first, you first of all, better now? he certainly yes. Yes. certainly made a case uh, maybe for a new nickname in Dapper Dan. Comes from a sweater to a very nice suit, I might add. And uh, is this any indication of how serious things are getting? You know, you were coming off the what executive of the year, Major League Baseball executive of the year. It was just before the season started. Loose in a sweater, pair of running shoes and jeans. Well, and I, was on my way, I was on my way home from work that day. Today I'm on my way into the office, so it, it's a little different. I told Terry I'd wear the shades if we had a 10-game losing streak, but All right, since well, things aren't that bad, I'm going to go with the regular glasses. By the time we, by the time we air this, this way. By, by the, I'll try it this way for a while. Just some theater. We've got a, we've got a while to go. He'll put them back on. Yeah. This, we should be honest, this is being taped on June 23rd. Right, the day before so, St. Jean-Baptiste Day. Right. So hopefully and so they could have a 10-game losing streak <laughs> by the time it's aired, but we hope not, certainly. Uh, this season, as of June 23rd, hasn't gone exactly according to plan. Uh, what happened? What fell apart? What didn't happen that was supposed to happen so far? Well, our primary problem has been the starting pitching, and we haven't had consistent starters, and that's the key to the whole, to, to the whole ball club. For one reason or another, uh, our plans in spring training for our three, four, and five starters that haven't materialized into consistent work. And I think that's the only thing that has kept this team from putting together some long winning streaks. And in particular, uh, you know, the Phillies have a big lead at this point. They're playing 700 ball. They're on a pace to win 115 games. So in terms of where we are in the standings, uh, very few clubs are going to be able to compete with that type of uh, with that type of record so our concern is primarily getting our starting pitching organized so it's consistent so we can win the number of games we're supposed to win. When you see the Philadelphia Phillies playing 700 ball is there a tendency to almost panic and react to maybe what the fans are saying go out and make a deal get somebody bring somebody in here and then you go back to reality and say if everyone on this team was playing at their top we wouldn't be playing 720 ball ahead of the Philadelphia Phillies. Yeah, I, I think that uh, Felipe's had the right approach, and he, his is, you know, we can't worry about the Phillies. We can't worry about our competitors. We have to get our team organized. We have to get our players performing like they can perform, and that's been the focus. You know, are we going to go out and get uh, a couple of players that are going to have us play 720 for this year? Uh, probably not, but we're, we're always looking for pitching, and we'd like to get some, you know, consistent starting or first division pitching in the trade market, but right now it's not really there. When I called around the last month and a half looking for pitching, uh, I called 20 teams, uh, or I called all 27 uh, teams <laughs> other than us, and 20 of them were looking for pitching. So the market is, is, is thin. How do you explain what happened to uh, Napoles this year? I mean, you look at his record for the past three years, he's gotten better and better, and this year he's just taken a powder. Well, that's that, that, that's a good question. That's one of the problems that we haven't been able to get resolved to date. And uh, Chris Neville's going into the season as a qualified major league pitcher with a lifetime ERA of 3.3. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, I don't really have a good answer. Uh, can I? Can he I hasn't throw been, out an he hasn't been able to perform. Can I throw out an answer? Sure. It's it's just an opinion. It's not based on any. I don't know the man at all. Uh, 
it seems to me that he's had a lot of trouble establishing his character on the field. And this was a season in which he was to establish himself as the third starter as a key ingredient of the ball club. This was supposed to be and was hopefully going to be a breakthrough year for him and he couldn't handle that. Well, you know, I, for whatever reason he hasn't pitched even uh, like he pitched last year. And uh, he was one of the more consistent uh, starters the year before. When he first came up, I think he was the National League Player of the Month. In September he was 6-2 and two his first year. Um, and we, I saw some steady improvement his first couple of years in the league. This is his third full season in the league, and he has an opportunity to really emerge. Uh, he hasn't been able to do that. But, you know, I, I don't think you can put the fortunes of one team on one player. Uh, we've had some uh, other players that haven't had as good a years as we had hoped to to date. Uh, you know, we are not uh, halfway through the season, so there's a lot of baseball left to be played. And uh, there is, a, you know, a lot of good baseball to be played at Olympic Stadium from some of these young players. So, um, you know, I, to put the focus on one player, I, I think that's unfair because it is a team effort. And we are all in this together, you know, the front office, the players, the staff. And, uh, you know, yeah, I just don't think it's fair. You, but know. you obviously thought that the pitching was pretty well set. And so people, how much, let's put it this way, how much did money play a part in not going after Deshays, for instance, who's now 8-4, and four, or Sanderson, all these sort of veteran guys. You thought, you believed that Bottenfield and uh, Jones could do the job. Did money play a part in, those guys are all big money guys. Well, you know, not if them. you take a look at what Sanderson has done, uh, he's, he was 7-2, and two. I think he's lost his last four or five decisions. He's been and hammered his last few. His, his ERA has, has uh, steadily increased. Uh, Deshays got off to a good start. Uh, Jimmy Jones, we signed to do that job that a Deshays or a uh, Sanderson would do. Uh, Jimmy Jones got off to a good start, but he hasn't, you know, followed through uh, after the first month of the season. We signed him to do that job. Those guys aren't particularly big money pitchers. Uh, they, they make a little bit more than what we're paying Jimmy Jones. But for us, we were hoping that was going to be our, you know, the fifth spot in our rotation. And we were looking for uh, someone to emerge from the young pitchers that we had on the staff uh, to, to fill in those three and four slots. Brian Barnes has pitched pretty well as a starter. He's, he's done a, a nice job. Uh, Kent Bottenfield recently has come around and pitched pretty well. Uh, and we had Jones to help us get off to a good start to start the season. I think he did his job for the first month. And then because of his health, he hasn't been able to do it. Do you agree with people who say that the Expos have four or five fifth starters. I'm I'll throw in Jeff Shaw into the list you just mentioned. You got Kenny Hill and Dennis Martinez and then the rest are fifth starters and that's really characteristic of the problem that the team has had. Well we have two frontline starters and then we have uh, a number of starters that are qualified major leaguers but they're not what I would call first division starters. Starters that can win more, a lot more than they can lose. Um, we're fortunate to have two frontline starters and we were hoping one of the young pitchers would emerge it didn't happen this year you called the other 27 teams about pitching and they're all looking for pitching I would imagine though that a lot of your young players the Expos young players are very attractive though to the other 27 teams got some future superstars on this team and Greg Colburn and Mike Lansing there's a whole bunch of guys there that I'm sure are very attractive to the teams that you've called well yeah they're good players they're uh, they're young and they should continue to improve but is somebody going to take them for a frontline starter? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure. I'm not sure they're valuable players, but uh, the starting pitcher is probably the most valuable and sought after commodity in the major league market. Address the perception that is out there, held by some people, that money is in the way of everything here, or lack of money. Well, I, I don't really know why we keep focusing on the money. The point is that we're operating the club on the revenues from the market. Uh, and this market does not have the revenues of a lot of other clubs in baseball. So we're doing the best that we can with the resources we have. And I don't know why everybody wants to focus on money because the resources aren't there in this market to operate a club like they do in New York or t in Boston. So, I mean, I don't, uh, it, to me it's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a point that, you know, everybody wants to focus on the money. Well, you know, the money isn't there. The, you know, the revenues aren't there. The revenue source isn't there for this franchise. I, so, think, I think the fans so, don't so, feel you so have a right to make a profit. They think that so you should break even. Whatever profit you're looking at on the season, and the fans are, are not business people for the most part. They're thinking with their hearts. Don't see where the Expo should make a profit. If the Expo's projected profit for 93 is $8 million or $7 million, 
the fans are thinking, hey, throw that $7 million in and try to turn it into $14 million by bringing a winner here and increasing the attendance? Well, first of all, the, uh, that article, what is it, Financial, financial World, financial world that projected a big profit for last year, that, that wasn't the case. Uh, they, they projected an 8 or $10 million profit for the franchise. Uh, that wasn't the case. And the other thing is that any profits go back into the operating of, of the ball club. Uh, you can uh, have a good year where you can make some money uh, like we did last year, ha had a very good year. Uh, but we've got a number of players that, uh, you know, whose, whose salary are going to increase over the next couple of years. And there's going to be a decrease in the overall revenue for Major League Baseball on the TV contract for next year. So. You know, it's not like uh, the owners take this money, put it in their back pocket, and say, you know, thank you very much to the fans. That's not the case at all. They're putting it back into the operation of the ball club. It's just that the, the revenues are reducing, and the salaries are always going up. So, you know, something's got to give. You've got a number of players making at or very near the major league minimum. It's in double figures, the number of players at that level. Is that by design, or is that by necessity? Uh, you know, you, you look at the Phillies, I'm not sure what they're paying uh, a Mill Thompson or an Eisenreich, but it's certainly a lot less than what the average Major League salary is. Is the situation here in Montreal standing in the way of getting uh, veteran backup uh, useful players at, let's say, 400, half a million dollars a year as opposed to backups at near or at the Major League minimum? Well, the, uh, we, we've got to put our money, the way I look at it, into our very best players, into our star players, our Dennis Martinez, our Kenny Hill, our Marcus Grissoms, our Larry Walkers. Uh, and if you're going to do that, your supplemental players, in other words, not your core players, you're not going to have the resources left to pay them the average major league salary, which is over a million dollars. And to me, that just doesn't make sense in our market. In terms of... Uh, the Phillies, the, the difference between us and the Phillies is not the extra players. We've got very good, valuable extra players. They might have a little bit more experience in Philadelphia. But the difference between us and them, to me, is the consistency of our starting pitching. Now, they signed some good free agents in the offseason. They signed Thompson. They signed him to a multi-year deal, a very lucrative deal. It's like over $1.6 million, which to me really surprised me. Uh, in Cavillia, I think, is going to make close to a $1 million. Uh, Eisenreich, I think, has a base that uh, will bring them up to close to a million dollars. So uh, they have ended up doing a starting role uh, for that team. I know Incavilia has, and they've got a lot of RBIs out of them. In terms of us, does that make a lot of sense for us? Uh, it, I don't think so, because we need the money to pay our star players. Oh, hold, hold on a second, because because of those players, as well as the star players that they have on the Phillies, their attendance, instead of being 18,000 a game, is now closer to 30,000 a game. And it's only because they're winning. And they're only winning because they've got those players who are helping them win. And as a result, their investment in the Eisenreichs and the Mill Thompsons is resulting in increased revenue. And they're no worse off. In fact, they're better off. So you have to invest, if you take the Philly formula, in order to bring a winner and in order to get more fans and more revenues. Well, I think that's one way of looking at it. I, I've seen a lot of clubs invest. Uh, like the Mets, like the Dodgers uh, in their season, uh, like the Red Sox, and then I've seen their season go right down, right down the hill. So it depends on your, uh, you know, how much risk you want to take, uh, how much uh, resources you have uh, before you go out and take that gamble, because this is a crapshoot. Uh, you know, <laughs> you never know what the type of chemistry you're going to put together. So if, if, if you uh, have the resources and you're comfortable with that gamble, uh, sometimes it works. Most of the time it doesn't. Terry, you've been covering the team all year. <clears throat> are you surprised at all that this team does not have Franklin Stubbs, Jack Clark, or Lee Stevens? Those are the three guys that came in at one time, uh, one of which or all of which to play for a space, and none of them uh, well, I have played no a game. Pro I mean, I, I, pres I would have liked to have seen Clark here to, uh, to back up uh, Walker in the lineup, but it didn't happen. Uh, as far as Stevens and Stubbs go, you know, I have no problem with Vanderwall and Colburn at first base or uh, Bollock as far as... As opposed to those as guys. As opposed to those yeah. guys. Good, good Lord. But what I'm interested in, you mentioned veterans. The other night, Dennis showed what a veteran's about last Friday night. Uh, the team was coming off two straight wins against the Phillies. They had a chance the day off to digest it. If ever a team ne needed a lift or if ever a guy provided a lift for a team to build some momentum, it was Dennis last Friday night. Now, what... And what happened was the team on Saturday and Sunday they did not play well, and they were very flat as well as uh, against the Mets. 
the first game against the Mets. Do you think that a veteran? Do you think that the 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 boys might have gotten too high after that win, and then they were let down afterwards? Do you think that veterans around might have been able to tell everybody, "Hey, let's be cool, let's build on this," and that the inexperience, in fact, contributed to that flatness? I know it was uh, there was a couple of errors in an inning. We gave two two hundred runs in an inning, and Rojas gave up a homer. But the team has looked flat since that game. Now you have said this. You've compared this team to the Dallas Cowboys as far as being the youngest team in baseball. Go. What a, what a long-winded question. But what I'm asking you <laughs> is, do you think that veterans would have been able to provide some stability after that? After if there was ever a chance to build some momentum, that was it, and they didn't do it. Is that youth that caused that? Well, the, I think the veterans that have been around the league they provide a steady influence on a ball club. In terms of momentum, I think momentum is in your starting pitching. If you control the game with your starter, you get momentum from game to <coughs> game. I don't think you necessarily carry momentum from one game into the next. I think the fortunes of the game are determined by the starting pitcher for the most part. And that's how you build momentum, by having good starters in your rotation. A lot of the young players have uh, been around the league uh, one time. Uh, but, you know, over the course of 162 games, you have to have been through it a couple of times to be emotionally stable. And that, to me, is one of the keys to having a good team, is having some guys that are stable over the course of the season. We get good leadership from Felipe Alou uh, and his coaches, who have been around. Uh, they've played. They're very professional. And uh, they have been a steady influence on this ball club. There are your two starters right there. Uh, Dennis is certainly uh, cause for a lot of discussion. He's not signed. He's upset over the fact that you didn't uh, give him an extension. Uh, what's going? A lot of fans are wondering. A lot of fans uh, say that, uh, that if you do trade him, they're not going to go to the stadium because he's one of the reasons they do go to the stadium. Uh, you're left in a, in, in a delicate, very delicate and difficult situation with with uh, the agreement expiring, Dennis's contract expiring, the ball club believing it's a contender, yet the Phillies opening up a healthy lead. Uh, how have you handled the situation? Has your mood changed? Has your thought process about Dennis and what you might do with him changed at all from day to day or week to week? No, I think we've been very straightforward with Dennis Martinez. He would have liked to have, have his contract extended at the start of the season. And we told him at that time we weren't going to be in the extended mode until we find out what our revenues were going to be for next year and what the players' agreement was going to be. Uh, and that hasn't set particularly well with him, but, uh, you know, that hasn't changed uh, based on how he's pitched. He's pitched very well for us uh, this year as well as every other year that he's been with us. But, I'm t I mean, in terms of what you might do, uh, Obviously, does it, or maybe not so obviously, does it depend on, on how the club goes from here on in? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, we'll, we'll evaluate that Dennis Martinez uh, situation later on in the year. We'll have to evaluate our uh, trade options uh, at some point uh, later on in the season. Uh, we'll have to evaluate our ability to re-sign him for next year. Do you think that next year is another year where you're going to come forward with the philosophy of the one-year contract for everybody? Well, uh, we're going to take a look at that at the end of the year. I, I don't know that uh, we have decided that yet, but uh, until we get a better handle in terms of what our revenues are going to be, uh, we're going to be short. We're not going to go for long-term commitments. Do you get the sense of any frustration on the part of any <coughs> of the players that they would like? They see their friends, because they've grown up playing ball with the other players, signing the three-, four-year deal. And you get the sense that maybe some of these players feel trapped in Montreal, the city of the one-year contract, whereas all their confrères on other teams are, you know, signing two, three-year contracts. I haven't heard that from. Uh, I haven't heard that from our players. Just the just the Dennis thing again. Uh, <laughs> Terry, save me here. Well, I don't know what you're where you're. Uh, are you worried that the, I mean, Dennis is making a lot of noise about walking next year, or you might have to trade. There you go. What, what are you, uh, are you interested in getting Dennis back next year? Because without him, you're down to one pitcher at this point, one frontline pitcher. Have well, you painted your, has, has the club painted itself into a corner on this? Uh, well, I think when you tell a player in the last year of his contract that you're not going to extend it before it expires, which is what we did, you have to be prepared to live with the consequences, which is that that, that player will go to work for somebody else at the end of the season. So uh, we have psychologically prepared ourselves for that possibility that Dennis Martinez won't be with the ball club next year. 
uh, and we've tried to get some pitchers ready in our training program to step in and, and do the job at the major league level. But w you know, what, what are we going to do? I, I can't tell you what we're going to do with Dennis Martinez. That, that remains to be resolved. I in the event that he does go to work for another ball club, uh, we would have the option of trading his contract, which is not something that we're interested in doing right now. Or we could uh, uh, receive draft choices, which is what we got for Spike Owen last year. And then Spike Owen we replaced with Cordero and Lansing, which was very helpful to us. We also picked up two draft choices, and we put the money that would have gone to a salary uh, towards uh, the Shields and, and Grissom and Kenny Hill. So that worked out pretty well for us. Uh, the Dennis Martinez situation isn't resolved yet, but those are some of the options that we can consider. But other teams locked up their races. <clears throat> I mean, Riho signed, Clemens signed. Uh, do you think that the, I mean, you had a policy of the one-year contract, but do you think in retrospect, perhaps because of Dennis's age and, I mean, and his status, quote unquote, on the team, his uh, aloofness on the team, as it were, he's not really part of it, uh, you, could have, you should have made an exception in this case? No, I don't think so. I think uh, if you're going to operate a, a ball club, you should do it with some consistent set of, of rules and standards, which you apply to everybody. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, decision on Dennis Martinez, uh, you know, that just hasn't been resolved yet. I never, I never really thought that the reason Dennis had a one-year contract was because everyone else had one. I worked under the assumption, now you'll tell me if I was wrong, that Dennis' situation was you sign him to a one-year contract and let's see how effective he is at 38 years old. Maybe you, you don't want to lock into a guy 38, 39, 40, 41, which would be pretty, pretty well understandable. But now I think he's proven that he can continue to pitch effectively probably for another two or three seasons. So my question really is, was it because everyone else had a one-year contract or because he didn't want to lock in long-term to Dennis Martinez, the 37-year-old? Well, he was finishing you know, up was, a three-year contract. Yeah, Dennis right. was in the third year of a three-year contract, which he signed uh, prior to becoming a free-look free agent. What's this? This is 93, right? Mm -hmm. So right. for the 91, 92, and 93 season. It was three years in length. That was the policy of the ball club at the time. I think it's a good policy in terms of any, any ball player, any pitcher. And it was also ending at the same time that the players' agreement ended and the television agreement ended, uh, which I think is a sensible business approach uh, towards uh, earmarking your resources for the long term. Um, you know, the, the TV contract is in. We don't know what the revenues are going to be. The players' agreement is up. We don't know what that's going to be. So uh, do we want to extend above and beyond that? Uh, not right now. If we don't know what revenues we're going to have to operate the ball club, are we going to commit $4 million to one player? What if our payroll is $12 million next year? Uh, then what are we going to do with a lot of our young players? And that's not to say that Dennis Martinez is an important part of this ball club, because he is. But until we get some certainty in terms of what the resources we are going to have to operate the club, I don't think it makes any sense to commit them. Do you think his stated uh, wish to leave, since you didn't give him the extension, would change if, if policy changed, everything was agreed to, this new collective bargaining agreement was taken care of, you, you handed some two-year contracts out, you said to Dennis, Dennis, we're willing to make a commitment of two years, throw out a figure, eight million. Uh, do you think that initially he was talking uh, emotionally because his, his uh, desire for a long-term contract was nixed by you guys, and that at that point, after thinking about it, he might consider coming back to Montreal, or is that you get, you get scared when you hear talk of a 38-year-old getting $8 million over two years? Well, I, I think that Dennis Martinez likes Montreal. I think he's been a very effective pitcher here. Uh, I don't really know what his response would be if we, if we decided to uh, offer him a contract during the season. We're, we're not going to do that at this point. At the end of the season? At and the, and at, if everything is taken care at of? At the end of the season, we'll have the option to do that. Uh, Terry, what do you think his you know, response? I, I, do you know I, don't, him I don't really know. I don't know. I think, I think Dennis is going to walk. I mean, he's going to be a free agent for <clears> sure. And he, he, uh, Dennis knows he only has a couple of years left, and he's got an opportunity to probably make real big bucks somewhere. I'll go against the grain. I would never pay Dennis Martinez $8 million for two years if I were the GM or the owner of this baseball team. I go out and spend that $8 million on a younger pitcher, on a guy 25, 26, well, 27, 28 years old. Swindell's years getting $4 million. Drabeck's getting $4 million. Smiley's getting $4 million. Smiley's getting $4 million. Smiley's getting $4 million. Smiley's two and eight. But those guys were paid $4 million for what they're supposed to do. Dennis is getting older. I personally, if I own the team, wouldn't pay Dennis $8 million at 39, 40 years old. I would rather take a gamble on what Drebeck and Smiley were supposed to do. They are great pitchers. They'll probably, they're in a funk. Smiley's never, come out no, of it. Smiley's, I don't think you can say Smiley. I don't think you can put Smiley in Dennis's category. 
Uh, but you can certainly put Drabeck in Dennis's category. Drabeck's another story. Greg Maddox is another story. But uh, it, it is an interesting situation because of the age factor. But Dennis, I don't think, has come up with too many sore arms throughout his career. There was a couple of years where he hardly pitched at all because of his, his uh, alcohol problems. And uh, uh, two years, I think, would be an absolute limit for a guy who's 38. A lot of 40-year-old guys watching I, the show are, are, are certainly going to think, you know, What's this guy talking about? You don't, don't be discriminatory against guys who are older, but this is a game where you got to be thinking about things like that. There's a lot of organizations that refuse to uh, lock into anything more than a three-year contract for a pitcher, for any pitcher, regardless of his status, and I, I would assume you would agree with that kind of policy. Asterix next to Clemens' name. Yes. Well, I, I think that's a good policy, but if you look at all the free agent pitchers that signed last year, they got four-year deals. Mm -hmm. uh, Swindell, Smiley, um, Drayback. David Cohn. David Cohn. Oh, I think Cohn got three years, didn't he? He got three? Yeah. And he got about six. Three years million. at 18 million. He got all the money. He got all the money those other guys got, but he got it in three years and he got half of it up front. Um, I think three years is good. There's a certain amount of risk that uh, the club takes when they earmark all that money towards one of their pitchers. And uh, there's a certain amount of risk that the club takes on a long term deal in terms of performance. The last few long term deals that this ball club has signed, uh, Martinez has been very good and very productive, <clears throat> but the other ones we ended up uh, not getting the kind of production that we had hoped we get at the time we signed them. Galarraga, uh, Tim Burke, uh, Wallach, uh, Tim Wallach. We we didn't get the kind of production that we had hoped to get at the time when we signed these players to long-term contracts. So all the attention is is on Dennis Martinez, and excuse me for playing the GM because I'm not. But the same way I wouldn't pay Larry, Wa uh, I wouldn't pay Dennis Martinez eight million for for two or three years at his age. What about Ken Hill? Isn't he the kind of guy that you want to grab a hold of? He looks like he's going to be a very solid pitcher for a very long time. Yeah, well, I mean, I really like Kenny Hill, and he has emerged as one of the top pitchers in the league. Uh, he is a three-plus player, and at this point, with the with the agreement, uh, without given him a long-term commitment, we have the ability to, to pay him and keep him with the club for a number of years. Of course, he has had elbow problems in the past. Any pitcher, especially someone with arm or elbow problems, just one pitch away from, you know, you lock yourself into four years at three, four million dollars a year. I, I don't have a problem with that policy at all. No, I'm talking I would, two, I would three years. It. I'm talking three years. Once, you know, the time comes, Kenny Hill's the kind of guy I don't think that uh, he can let go from this ball club, although he's nowhere near right now. Well, especially if Dennis gone. walks. Especially if Dennis walks, absolutely. Let's go back to uh, right, we're next gonna wrap show. up. Next show, Terry. Next show. You want to we'll lead off the next show? No. You can lead off the next show. We're out of time for this one. All right. Can I have a cigarette? <laughs> if he you puts can have whatever his glasses you want. on, you can have whatever you want. All right, we'll be back again next week with Dan Duquette, part two. We'll be of back the in about two minutes. Dan, Dan Duquette <laughs> miniseries. In real time, we'll be back in about three minutes. But in TV time, we'll be back in a week with Dan Duquette. Thanks for watching the Sports Hot Seat. And, and Terry du Hague. Duquette and, and Terry, Terry Hague, Hague will get their starter <laughs> gifts after next week's show. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot for listening and watching. We'll catch you next week on the Hot Seat. Sports Hot Seat is brought to you in part by Sport Buff in Plaza Alexis Neon, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear. Sports Hot Seat is brought to you in part by Sport Buff in Plaza Alexis Neon, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear.
Welcome back to the Sports Hot Seat. Mitch Garber with Mitch Melnick and our guests for the second straight week in a row, Terry Haig of CIQC Radio. He's on after every Expo game, every Expo night game during the week from Monday to Friday. And Mitch Melnick, obviously, as you know, the drive home show on CIQC 600 from 4 to 6 Monday through Friday. And the other guy? The other guy. The guy no, you'll talk about the other guy. Forget the other guy's on the 9 suit. to 5. Top, Top billing. Is Top this billing. a, what is this, $400, $500? This More? isn't a 9 to 5 job. <laughs> well, how much is this suit? The suit? I, I, I would be embarrassed to say. <laughs> the 1979 prices, I would think. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys should talk the way you guys are dressed. We started, though, <clears throat> same way as you, before the starter people saved us. We right. had to wear suits on the set every day. Well, that's, why, that's why I came to the show, to see if I could get clothes like you guys. That's right. Actually, Dan Duquette has asked for a lot of uh, Boston Celtics stuff. Where does that come from? I mean, I know you grew up in Massachusetts, but are you that big a Celtic fan? Well, the Celtics are probably the best organization ever put together, I would say. Uh, in there's terms a of team winning. here. There's a franchise here in the <coughs> city, Dan. The, the hockey they, they team. They play on ice. Oh, there's a they, hockey team 20, here? Yeah, they've won 24 <laughs> championships more than, any other, is one. Is there more than any other franchise, including the Celtics. Is that right? Yeah. I didn't realize there was a hockey team here. That's all right. <laughs> Terry, you were on the brink of asking a question last week. And it's been a week, so you might not remember that question. But Well, I want to ask that question. Well, actually, we've had a lot of calls about, and I've asked you specifically, but maybe you could explain it to the viewers, uh, the Galarraga thing. Now, Mitch and I have both said on our radio shows that uh, we don't, you know, it's, it's a cheap shot to say that the guy could not come home again. However, what did he offer his services to you? Uh, why didn't uh, the Expos sign him? Because it was Philippe who originally uh, originally recommended him, I believe, in Venezuela. Right. What what's your what was your thinking on Galarraga? Well, Galarraga had a lot of chances to perform while he was here with the Expos for several years, and in the last couple of years in particular, he struggled with a bat. Uh, last, of course, the year before last, we traded him to St. Louis for Kenny Hill. We got a good pitcher out of it. Kenny Hill's one of our best pitchers, and, and we're glad we have him. Uh, Galarraga is with a hitting coach, Don Beller. His hitting coach is St. Louis. They did some work together there to get him straightened out. And he's having a good year uh, on a one-year contract. They called me about an hour and a half before they signed with Colorado to see if we had any interest. And I told them that we didn't at that time, that we liked uh, our option, and we liked uh, Greg Colburn at first base, and we were going to give him a shot at the job. Hitting, speaking of hitting, now, Generally speaking, it looks like a very different team on the field. That was an organizational decision to insist, and it goes all the way down, according to Tommy Harper, who was on play at the plate the other night. Make the guys <laughs> wait. Make the guys, make the pitcher work. How much of a part did you play in that? Well, Felipe and I last year discussed, we had a number of young hitters at the major league level that didn't have the patience to wait for a good ball to hit. And the key to hitting, uh, from my perspective, and you know, it's pretty straightforward, is that the hitters that are good hitters are good hitters because of the pitches they swing at. And if you're always swinging at the pitcher's pitches, you're, you're taking ineffective swings at balls that you don't have a good percentage to hit in the first place. Uh, so our focus, we're going to have a lot of young ball players coming up to the big leagues, and our focus was going to be on teaching these ball players to wait for a good ball to hit. If you wait for a good ball to hit, a lot of things happen. Number one, you get a lot of walks, and you have men on base when you hit. Uh, number two, you put the pressure on the pitcher. Uh, number three, you swing the percentages of you getting a better ball to hit in your favor. Number four, you get better balls to hit. Uh, and you end up scoring more runs for your ball club, which is the bottom line. Are you satisfied? I mean, certainly the most visible change has been uh, Grissom. He looks like a totally different hitter when he comes to the plate. Are you satisfied that the rest of the team is twigging into uh, this concept? It doesn't appear that all of them are. Well, I think early in the season, the emphasis that Felipe and Harper put on the program and we put on the program throughout the organization was very, very effective. We had some young hitters show patience. We had Cordero get off to a good start. Mike Lansing got off to a good start. Uh, uh, Greg Colburn got off to a good start. Uh, and now you see the, uh, the pitchers, uh, Frank Bullock got off to a good start. And now, uh, as you get into the season, you see the pitchers making an adjustment. And you see the players trying uh, very hard. Uh, I think they look at their averages. That's a mistake to keep their averages up. And the pitchers expand the strike zone on the players. And whereas the, the hitters were waiting and not swinging at the pitchers' pitches early in the year, uh, now the pitchers are expanding the strike zone, and we're not getting as good balls to hit. Consequently, we're not on base as much. Uh, we're not, we don't have as many extra base hits. So there's a little adjustment there to be made. 
uh, you can see the adjustment that Marcus Grissom has made this year. He'll let that uh, outside breaking ball go by. Uh, he knows what teams are going to do to him. He has a better idea. Uh, he knows what he hits well, and he'll look for his pitch. And you can see that now Marcus Grissom, his on-base percentage is up about 60 points from his career. His slugging percentage is close to 500, where in the past it's been about 380. Uh, and uh, he's hitting 322. So there is a player that has matured in line with the hitting program and the philosophy that Lou and Harper have been expounding on this season. Are you saying that the best hitters are the best adjusters? We hear so often about pure hitters. He's a natural hitter. He has a natural swing. But are the best hitters the best adjusters, guys who can adjust to the changing pitching and the changing attitudes toward their, them as hitters better than other players? Well, I think that the uh, key ingredients of a good hitter are uh, a good balance at the plate uh, and, and good wrists. I like hitters like Grissom with good wrist assists and Walker, Delano, the Shields. Ray Colburn. Uh, yeah, they can get the they can get the bat through the strike zone uh, very quickly. They, they also have a lot of strength in their forearms. Uh, uh, but having said that, let's say you have hitters like that. The difference between good hitters uh, and ineffective hitters, uh, inconsistent hitters, is patience, and that's patience uh, in waiting for a ball to hit. Uh, and that comes from, from knowing the strike zone. Now, when you go to the plate, you can have no fear of striking out because if you, if you do have fear of striking out, you're going to offer at a pitch early on in the count. And hitters make their living by getting out, uh, uh, or pitchers make their living by getting out hitters uh, on balls that they can't do a lot with. We saw Tom Glavin pitch against our young hitters, uh, a lot of young right-handed hitters, where he just commanded the outside part of the plate. And, we did not wait for balls to hit. The way to beat Tom Glavin is to go to right field because he commands the outside part of the plate. He keeps the ball in the big part of the ballpark. He's not going to walk you. He's not going to let you hit a home run. So the way to beat him and the way they beat him in the All-Star game last year was to go to right field. But when he pitched against us, he just threw our right-handed hitters, our young right-handed hitters away. Uh, they all tried to pull him. So what's the, uh, you know, what do we get? We get a lot of ground balls to the shortstop uh, and the third baseman. Uh, whereas if we had the patience to, to one, wait for a ball to hit, or two, uh, take what he'll give us and, and go to right field, we would have had a much more effective game. But t the key, the key is having patience and waiting for a good ball to hit. And that takes uh, some experience. It takes a lot of confidence. Uh, uh, but that is the key to being a good hitter, waiting for a good pitch to hit, something that you can do something with. Pitchers are more intelligent than hitters, although one pretty smart guy was Ted Williams. Now, I know you must have been very young when he played his last game. In fact, he homered in his last major league at bat in 1961. But growing up in the Boston area, Williams must have been close to God for anybody who was a baseball fan. Well, I think Ted Williams was one of the uh, 60? Thank you, few sir. franchise players that uh, have been in baseball over the years. You know, they talk about all these other players that are quote unquote franchise players, but there's very few of them. Ted Williams was one. Uh, my brother had his book uh, when he was 10 years old, The, the Science of Hitting, and uh, he read that uh, and gave it to me, I think, when I was about eight years old. And, and that's what he talked about. I mean, Ted Williams was a great hitter, but he also led the league in walks. He had several years where he's over 100 walks, and some years he had over 140. You look at the best hitter in the National League today is Barry Bonds, and what does he have? He has over 100 walks, uh, and that's from waiting for a ball to hit. Ted Williams' career on base percentage, career is 483. Extraordinary. His career. Extraordinary. I mean, you know. In career batting average 345 or 344. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is the guy that played the percentages. If, if you're a pitcher uh, and you throw the ball over the plate, you automatically get out the hitters seven out of the ten times. He was recently on the, the Bob Costa show on NBC, and the, the Costa's asked him, who he likes among today's ball players, and he said there's too many to name. There's a lot of great young talent, big strong kids that he likes watching. He says, but the battles aren't the same between the, the batter and the pitcher. The batter doesn't hit according to the count. The batter doesn't hit according to what the pitcher did to him the previous two at bats. The batter doesn't approach the uh, the at bat according to the wind, the conditions, the stadium, the score. But the pitcher is approaching the at bat with all those things in mind. Or the good pitcher is. Well, I, th I think your, your uh, premium pitchers do. I mean, if you take a look at Tom Glavin, he's one of the top pitchers in the league. Tom Glavin knows exactly what he has, what kind of stuff he has on what day, what pitch is working for him. He knows what hitters in the lineup are the good hitters. He knows what hitters he can get out relatively easy uh, I I without using his breaking ball. I against us, it looked to me like he just got our right-handed hitters out by throwing away. But with Grissom, he'd come in, he'd show him a breaking ball, strike one. 
uh, and then he would he would move the ball around. But with the other hitters, uh, he would just throw the ball away from them and wait for them to get themselves out. The philosophy of hitting that you're describing here is one of the reasons I look forward so much to seeing Jack Clark in an Expos uniform. He was always one of my favorite hitters. He was the classic cleanup hitter who can hit 35, 40 home runs a year and also walk over 100 times. What happened with the Jack Clark story, which dragged on and on? Well, we wanted to get Jack Clark into uh, our lineup because we thought that he would be a good role model for our young hitters because of the patience that he exhibited at the plate. Uh, we tried to put something together where he'd come with us for this season. Uh, he had too many uh, personal commitments. Uh, he had a lot of personal problems that are yet to be resolved. And uh, after trying to do it in West Palm Beach and going back to California, he finally just called us and said, I I'm sorry, I, c I can't do it this year. And uh, w we released him from his contract. He just had too many irons on the fire that were not resolved. We thought at the time we signed him, he would get these things resolved in a month or two time. But uh, that wasn't the case, so he's going to take the year off and try to come back next year. Did you get a sense that Jack Clark really, really wanted to play here? Jack Clark was sincere in coming to Montreal because uh, he went on a, a very intense training program in West Palm Beach, and he stayed down in Florida trying to get himself prepared for the season. He just, he just had some other commitments. Was he paid by the Expos during the time that you had him? Uh, he was paid by us for uh, a period. He was on a minor league uh, contract. Most important is he was paid by the Boston Red Sox a healthy sum before when they released him. Do you think if maybe he, uh, he had been, if he wasn't the recipient of, uh, I think, the equivalent of $1.9 million for the Red Sox for this season, that there would be more incentive for him to earn a healthier paycheck? And that, that would, do you think that was a factor at all? The fact that he's getting paid, but he doesn't have to play. Yeah, well, the incentive is there for him to continue playing. Um, because he would be working towards his contract for next year, but he had a guaranteed amount of money from the Red Sox whether he played or not. And he just decided that he'd get his personal life in order uh, and then try again next year. Can we get back to uh, what Mitch was talking about earlier, Terry was talking about, about how the game has changed since Ted Williams, not to compare anyone to Ted Williams. But we've talked to a lot of players and had some players even on this show who don't watch very much baseball on television and who are really not students of the game of baseball. Like, I get the impression that Ted Williams is, were real students of the game. And to factor in the money you're talking about with Jack Clark, I would have to imagine that's a, that's a big factor there. But do you see that these players, and you're not much older than I am, and you're quite a bit younger than, <laughs> <laughs> than Terry is, but do you think that these players are much less students of the game? There's no real incentive, if you're making all that money, to go and study the, you know, the, the reports on pitchers you're going to face in the next two, three series down the road. Well, I think the best players in the league uh, will study the game. The stardom in this profession demands that you know your profession and, and you learn it from the ground up. Uh, uh, Ted Williams uh, was a very intense man, and uh, he was uh, very well focused. That's all he did. There are some players in the league uh, that will go on to the Hall of Fame that have the same type of focus that uh, Ted Williams had when he played. George, Bonds is George like Brett is one. You know, Bonds, Bonds, is, Bonds, Bonds is a very good example. I mean, here's a guy that uh, has the same kind of relationship with the media that Ted Williams had. Uh, uh, but the stardom in any profession demands that a total commitment. It, it's almost a spiritual commitment. On the, on the basis of these athletes. Now, in, in professional sports, we have young athletes that get into their profession at a relatively young age. And the learning curve has to be increased because they're going to be at their peak years when they're 27 or 28 mm -hmm. years old. So you've got to cram everything you can get into it. And if you want to be a star player, if you want to be an all-star, if you want to go to the Hall of Fame, you need to study your profession like a lawyer would study his or to be, to be, in, the top, to be in the top of your field. Now, a lot of these players will make a lot of money just by being an average major league player. So in terms of the, ins the financial incentive, uh, all you have to do is stay around in the major leagues Hit to, 250, 260. to earn a decent salary. But if you want to be a star, you've got to come forward with the type of commitment that Williams is talking about. And the players that do that, they end up having long careers. So let's take a look at Jim Palmer. Jim Palmer pitches according to the way the, uh, way the wind is blowing out in the ballpark. You can see him ch check all those things out. I think Glavin does it. Uh, I think uh, Jeff Reardon knew exactly what he could do as a professional. Uh, Lee Smith, I mean, these are all the top performers in their profession, but they, they didn't get there by accident. I are mean, there less they, of they them, you think, plan. less guys committing to, the, to, to, their, uh, to their business, Terry? Well, what's happened, I don't know if Dan will confirm this or not, I mean, what's happened is in the old days you served a much longer apprenticeship in the minors and you learned the game. Now, 
the emphasis is on signing good athletes. Delano's a perfect example. He was basically a basketball player. So they don't serve the long, you didn't work your way up from D-ball and play six years in the minors to learn the game. They have to learn at the major league level, a lot of them. So that, the learning process or the learning curve happens, what, later or earlier, I guess. And it happens in the major leagues under much tighter scrutiny. So you've got all these other dimensions to deal with. Uh, as you go, you're in the majors and learning, and you've got, right? I mean, this yeah, is. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. See, the labor agreement is a lot different now, and the relationship between the club and the players is different. Uh, in the past, <laughs> when Ted Williams was a player, uh, the clubs could control the salary. I mean, you, you, you play for this amount for this team, or you don't play at all. Uh, now the, the players uh, have a lot more flexibility in terms of what they get paid, they have uh, other options in terms of where they're going to play, uh, and they receive a lot more money at a lot earlier in their career. And, and in some cases, in some cases, when they sign a long-term contract where the money is guaranteed, uh, the players are not held accountable for their performance on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, and that's why you see a, a, a trend in decreasing performance in a lot of players when they sign a long-term contract. Are you for or against performance clauses? Oh, I, I'm for them absolutely. I'm. I, I would love to Should be, be able, the only clause in a contract. I would love to be able to uh, pay the players based on their performance. I think that's how you get. That's how you get uh, better. Better play. That's how you get more careful players. That's how you get players paying attention to detail. And that's what it takes to be a, a good, solid major league player. Okay. Well, speaking of detail, then would you pay them for moving a runner from second to third? and taking it out, grounding out to second base. I mean, as long as, I mean, what's, you know, sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Well, in other words, a lot mean, of people think that leads to selfish performances. The performance clauses will have a guy play for himself. Yeah, well, reach these. I think you'd have to work it in uh, to a team concept because that, that is our intent. Uh, I mean, you know, no one player is, is bigger than the team. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of good players to have a good team, a good entertaining team for your fans. But, I think that you get better performance and better accountability uh, when you when you play when you pay them for what they did for you. you when, when they get rewarded for ineffective play, to me that is probably the worst thing that could happen uh, to a ball player in, in terms of him getting better in in his play because they are being rewarded for what for service time. Uh, I mean that's great that they were all in the big leagues, but that doesn't and help. last year's stats. Yeah, you get rewarded for last year's stats yeah, often too. E exactly, and and. Uh, uh, when you when you are rewarded for what you did, uh, I think that's the best way to compens well, you, compensate you, people. You told Marquise Grissom that stolen bases weren't as valuable, money-wise or in the team concept, as on-base percentage and batting average. Well, we told him that uh, stolen bases were not as uh, we weren't going to reward him for those as much as we would reward him for on-base percentage and a slugging percentage, and I think that was uh, a message that he got and he took into his play this year, and that has made him a better ball player. You're not concerned at all that somewhere down the line what was said and the manner in which it was said in that arbitration hearing is going to uh, lead to a divorce between Grissom and the Expos? Well, I think that uh, Marcus Grissom is a dedicated ball player, and although it was not conveyed in the, in the best form, I think he got the message in terms of production. And I think it, th this man is a ball player. I mean, he goes out and he plays. He plays every day. He plays hurt. He can feel his position. He can throw. He can hit. He can hit for power. Uh, I, I think the the uh, arbitration hearing has helped him grow as a ball player. But I don't necessarily think that it is uh, going to affect our ability to have him in a long-term relationship. Uh, I, I, I think it helped him. I, I don't think that he felt good about it, but I think that it helped him become a better player. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, who handled the arbitration for the Expos? It was a hired gun, right? We had a lawyer by the name of Frank Casey who Right, who, who makes his money on, uh, the, uh, makes his, his living on a commission on how much he saves. Don't you think it could have been better handled? Don't you think it could have been you or somebody that could have explained to Marquise beforehand, look, this is the game? That was his agent's job. Well, somebody, all right, let's, not, not you, then somebody should have explained to Marquise, and why didn't the Expos go in there? Why did they hire a guy to, to, to deal with that? Well, we tried to resolve our uh, contracts amicably, and we would prefer not to go to arbitration. In some cases, it's, it's, it's hard to avoid it. In, in our case, uh, we had already signed Delino, and uh, 
the market, uh, Olerud had already signed, Felix Jose had already signed, uh, David Justice had already signed. So the market was already established, the market was in. And I think from Marcus Grissom's perspective, the agent decided, well, I'm going to get that. I'm going to get at least mm -hmm. what the club has offered, 1.5. Why not roll the dice and go through an arbitration hearing and try to get 1.9? So to me, they had uh, little to lose by going to the arbitration as long as Marcus could go out and do his job. But and it wasn't explained to him what the, what the, what the game was. Let's not get into that again because it's, well, not, I, it's not the I, Expo's obligation to tell, to tell Marquis Grissom what's going to happen in that arbitration hearing. That's why he hires an agent to communicate with Dan Duquette or Bill Stone or whoever they're communicating with. You think Marquis Grissom ever got on the phone himself and, and spoke to Dan Duquette? I mean, you can answer that before the arbitration hearing. No, I don't, I don't think that was necessary, but uh, um, I think he, he understands now how he's paid and how he's compensated, and I think it's made him a better ball player. And, they sh and the Jays should have tied up Olerud long Oh, yeah, term. You, you mentioned Olerud. Uh, a lot of people, when he first came up, described his swing as a Ted Williams-like swing and that he was going to win a batting title one year. Again, this is taped. This, we're doing this on the 23rd of June. At that point, he was hitting 411. Do you think he can hit 400? Well, this is a boy that uh, has patience at the plate. He waits for a good ball to hit, and uh, he's a very gifted player. He has all the attributes of, of being able to hit 400. Uh, he came into the league, didn't spend any time in the minor leagues. He is surrounded by other good hitters. Uh, it's going to be difficult for anybody to manage the media and hit 400. Uh, you know, we've seen that by the way they followed Brett, by the way they followed Molitor when he had a 38-game hitting streak, for instance. So it's Carew. Yeah, Carew. I mean, it's very, very difficult, the media crush and the other pressures you have to deal with. If he can deal with those pressures, uh, this could be the year to do it. It's an expansion year. The pitching is diluted. And, uh, you know, who, who knows? He, he's going right into the prime of his career. What is he, 23 years, 24 years old? And uh, he'll need a little luck to do it. But, you know, he's off to a great start. How often did you go to Fenway when you grew up? Uh, we went to Fenway. Uh, my dad would take us down there a couple of times a year. I remember the first time I went to Fenway Park, we went with a sporting goods distributor by the name of Kai Hamilton, and he took us there, and uh, he had some shoes for Brooks Robinson. So we, he introduced us to Brooks Robinson, and he also introduced us to George Scott, who had played the year before in the minors close to uh, my hometown in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. So that was a... That, that was a big day. We got to meet uh, the Boomer and also uh, Brooks Robinson. Boomer is like a whale now. Yeah, he's a big man. I think he has a, a young boy that, in the minors because he called me a couple years ago. He had been to school in Louisiana and he was trying to get his boy into pro ball. Do you remember, was, would it be the 75 season, 67? I guess you were kind of young, right? 67, you were how old? Uh, 67, I would be, what, nine years old. So 75 would be a lot so better. 75. Fisk. Well, 75, to me, the biggest moment of that series was when Bernie Carbo came off the bench and hit a pinch hit three-run homer. I think that was, was that in game six? That was an incredible game six. That was game six. I had fallen asleep, and uh, my dad woke me up by screaming <laughs> with Bernie Carbo hit the ball out. And then, of course, we stayed up and we watched Carlton Fisk's legendary home run in game six. You know, it's kind of, sorry, Terry, I'll let you, just a second. It, it's just kind of sad being a lifelong Red Sox fan to see how that team operates. I don't know what kind of relationship you have with Lou Gorman, but it seems to me he closes his eyes and says, we need this guy to play here and let this guy go. It just doesn't seem to have any, uh, they don't seem to have any plan in, in orchestrating a team. The, the, the fans sense it. The media is starting to get on him in a little bit. There seems to be a feeling that uh, he's not going to last as a general manager that much longer. Is that a goal of yours, to become the general manager of the Boston Red Sox? Well, the, I mean, the Red Sox, that's a very difficult uh, be my fran goal. franchise to <laughs> operate. I, I know Andy McPhail had a quote a couple years ago. He said, if you paid me a million dollars, I wouldn't go to Boston to generally manage that team because of the, the passion of the fans and the rabid passion of the fans. You know, what Lou Gorman, I think, has done a pretty good job there. He has put together a couple of uh, uh, division winners, uh, and that's a tough market to go in. You got into this game, uh, this GM's game, uh, very early because of your love for this, for the love for baseball. Well, that's something that I always wanted to do. And, uh, I'm talking about your, your semi-pro team. Well, yeah, I mean, I got a lot of experience with the semi-pro team in Massachusetts, the Dalton Collegians that my brother and I started, and we traveled around New England. We traveled to uh, Baltimore, Maryland to play Johnny's, which is a very good amateur team. And, 
and uh, we went to New York State. We played against the Syracuse Junior Chiefs, which was a good Junior A team. We played some teams in the Cape and also the Boston Park League. But I got a lot of the experience that I use in uh, my current job by putting together an amateur team. I think a lot of people get a lot of experience in doing volunteer work. Uh, that they take on and use in their in their real in their real job. But that was because your baseball career was over. I mean, the Legion ball was done, and you, uh, yeah, you well, were in college. Yeah, we were in, we were done with American Legion, and we wanted to continue to play during the summertime. And this team we started up again uh, was a good way to do it. So not only that, my brother and I, uh, we were the groundskeeper, we were the public relations director. Uh, we hired and fired the manager, and we recruited the players. Uh, Recruit of the sponsors, whatever. So it was a lot of fun. Real quick, Carlton Fisk, unhappy in Chicago. The Expos have had experienced catchers throughout their history, basically. Gary Carter's gone. Not too many Cerrone's 45 gone. year olds. <laughs> Not too many of them. But he was a hero of yours. Any chance you would go for Carlton Fisk? I think Carlton Fisk, when he retires, is going to retire as a Chicago White Sox, and that, that'll be it. All right. All right. I don't know how you can say a guy who, who signed Matt Young to a multi-year guaranteed contract, <laughs> who let Ellis Burks go and then gets Calderon to play center field, is doing a good job. Other than that, it's been a wonderful Calderon's two hours. Center field? He's played center field this year. Yeah. A lot of center field. Too much center field. That's an interesting concept. Yeah. After letting Ellis Burks go. This is anyway. A, this is a very humbling game, baseball. <laughs> Have you been humbled yet? 